Good morning, everyone. My name is Dustin uh, with Ray. I'm the Director of Manufacturing. I just wanted to open this morning and, and give you guys a little background for today. Um, as you guys saw with our agenda, we are focusing with automation and employee retention and, and some of those factors that we're seeing in the communities right now. Um, one thing, just wanted to thank everyone. We had a last minute change. Um, just a little update. Our new office is close to being done here in Worcester. Um, as everyone knows, with construction, it never ends on time like you're hoping. And with COVID and everything else, it's really not um, ending like we would like. But we're getting there. We're probably a couple weeks away. So appreciate everyone being flexible, um, giving us a little grace or understanding as we've had to shift it. And thankful that Best Western was open and allowed us to, to come down here. Um, before we get started today, I did want to make one um, announcement. Um, Andrew Geyser, who's um, out of our Millersburg office, is going to be our Director of Manufacturing starting November 1st. Uh, Andrew has an extensive background, um, came from Smucker's, been with Ray five years, Andrew? Five? Um, doing a phenomenal job. And so Andrew has a lot of knowledge and experience with manufacturing, and one of our goals is to play to our strengths. And so we feel it's time for Andrew to take over and, and grow us as he has been. So now he has the title to go with all the work he's doing. So I um, wanna thank Andrew for that. Um, so today we're gonna get started. Our first presenter is Renee West. She's our director of HR and consulting. Um, so Renee's gonna start here and, and we'll just work through all of our, our speakers. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. And it's raining outside, it could be snow. So we can be thankful about that. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. We appreciate your time. And as mentioned, my name's Renee West. I'm the director of HR consulting here for the firm. Been with Ray for a little over six years and have been in HR. I'm gonna date myself, so I'm just gonna say over 20 years. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, so a lot has gone on in the HR field in the past year and a half, two years. Um, there's a lot of changes and a lot of differences that a lot of companies are working with. So today, our goal is to share some insight on what the current employment landscape looks like, talk a little bit about um, recruitment, employee retention, HR compliance, which is my favorite part of HR, and we'll share some best practices and ensure you're compliant with your I-9s. And we're gonna talk through some workplace trends, what we're seeing in the industry, and also some topics that you should continue to have on your radar for the rest of this year, and then also moving into 2022. So that's a lot of information. Um, again, you will be able to receive a copy of the slide deck that will have the information on here for you. And we are gonna take questions at the very end as well. So let's get started. So everyone's favorite topic, unemployment. Um, I do wanna speak briefly on the unemployment fraud that a lot of organizations and individuals have dealt with in the past year and a half, two years. We are still seeing some new unemployment fraud claims that are coming through. Believe it or not, I don't know how it's happening, but, but it is. So the state is continuing to try to recoup that, that fraud and that, those dollars that came from those fraudulent claims. Um, the process itself has been um, very challenging and very hard for some organizations. So again, if you know of any individual or company that is still receiving fraudulent claims, please uh, let us know or give me a call and I'm happy to help talk through that with you. So if we look at unemployment statistics, where are we from a statewide and a countywide basis? Unemployment rates are dropping. And one of the biggest pieces that we wanna talk about is as unemployment continues to drop, that of course, the re trying to recruit individuals is very challenging right now. Um, show of hands, who in the room is looking for employees for their organizations? And you have all those filled? No, unfortunately. So we'll talk today about some best practices as it relates to that. But if we look at the unemployment rates locally here, um, Franklin County is at 4.5%, Stark County 4.8%, Wayne County 3.4%, Tuscarawas is at 4 and Holmes County is the lowest and it's at 25 
So that's very challenging as you know the workforce is that most people are working. There are still challenges with being able to find that right talent and keep that talent as well. But we're hopeful that the unemployment stats will continue to, to decrease as businesses are back open, people are going back into the workforce. So let's talk a little bit about recruitment. Um, this We could talk about this for a whole day, if not longer. Um, one of the biggest things that we're talking to organizations about is setting your organization above others. You're an employer of choice. Whenever you're looking to hire individuals, it's important that you show the benefits of working at your organization. From culture to pay compensation to what you do to your company mission, it's very important because things are so competitive out there right now that the more you can show who your company is through your job postings and your communications, the more opportunity to have applicants see that and really know that your place is a good place to work. And it's really important, especially now, like I said, to just share and talk about why people like working with you, okay? One of the biggest pieces too is, as we said, 90% of all companies throughout the United States are hiring. That's almost everyone. That's all across the industries, not only in one manufacturing, but healthcare, um, et cetera. So it, we don't see this changing. Um, if anything, the, the job opening numbers will continue to rise. Um, and we're just hoping that from a recruitment perspective, we can give you some resources to help with that. One of the biggest pieces that we that we talk to, you know, we, I receive calls daily from from organizations that say, "I'm going to have to shut down my my production line today. I don't have people. What what am I supposed to do? How can I somehow help and you know be able to to get people to come here?" Um, one of the biggest pieces that we want to do is we need to look at what is your whole strategic recruiting plan. So as an organization, what are you currently doing to bring individuals into your organization? And a lot of times that's a conversation where we can come in and talk with you about, just talk me through what your process is and really determine are there any particular holes or areas of improvement that we could help give you resources for to really increase that, that recruitment and bring more talent into your organization. And again, it's just a discussion and sometimes having a third party come in and talk with you about that can really help determine where those next steps need to be. One of the biggest pieces too is when you're hiring, you need to know what you're hiring for. So, so I've had some companies say, well, I just want a person, I don't care. As long as they come in and are here and work, and I see some people smiling, so I'm sure that that's where a lot of you are right now. That, that is important, but that job description and knowing what you're looking for, knowing what those duties are, knowing what those qualifications are, are essential when you're recruiting, but also when you're developing your people, it's a really good idea to have those job descriptions down. And again, that's something that you know we can help talk you through if you do have questions um, to ensure that you're recruiting that right type of person for your role as well. Also looking at, as we go through your recruiting strategy, you know, how are you advertising for jobs? What type of resources are you currently using? Um, always looking at local trade schools, looking at high schools, looking at apprenticeship programs, looking at internships. Companies have really stepped out of the box in looking at what type of resources can they use to bring people into their organization. And these do not need to be extravagant and complicated programs. They're very useful and we have resources that we can share with you as to how to set those up. But a lot of, you know, some companies that I've talked to, you know, are working with local high schools in bringing individuals in to learn the trade as part of their, their internship program and then looking to eventually hire those candidates and hire those individuals into their firm or into their organization. So there's a lot of different ways to bring people in. It just takes time to think about how you wanna structure that. And there are resources, and I can share the website, it'll be in our slide deck for you, 
for the state of Ohio that have toolkits on how to set up internships, how to set up apprentice programs, if there's any employer grants that are out there as well that can help from a training perspective, that's also a resource. Any questions on any of that so far? I know that's a lot of info, okay? Also from a recruitment perspective, what resources are you utilizing? Job postings, I've heard a lot of companies that have said, you know, we just don't do a lot of job postings. We'll put a sign out in the front yard and that referral, or if it's a small community, brings people into the organization. So that is definitely very helpful um, for your organization as well. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of those other options for that. So you're looking to recruit and hire individuals. Retention of the people that you have is even more crucial now than it has been before. You, we're seeing organizations where it's, again, it's very competitive out there. Employees can basically go anywhere they want for a higher wage or a sign-on bonus or better benefits. So there's a lot of starting a new position and maybe staying there a month and then going to a different one and then going to a different company. So really looking at how can you retain your existing workforce? because you don't want those individuals leaving and then have to fill those positions as well. So one of the biggest pieces that we wanna look at is your structure. What are you offering your employees? And what, what do they like about being there at your organization? So really looking at your compensation package, your benefits, what sets you above, again, other employers when you're maybe having a certain starting wage and right down the street, the other company has a $2 more an hour starting wage and a sign-on bonus. So how do you compete with that? So really looking at your wage and your comp structure. And again, that's something that we're happy to talk with you about to again, really see, are you aligned with the area? Is your comp where it needs to be from a skill level and a tenure of your employees? So that's a big piece of that retention as well. One of the main things too is employee communication. Talk to many organizations and they say, sure, we talk to our people, which I'm sure you do, but do you really have a pulse on your organization and a pulse on what your employees are actually thinking? And the reason that we say that is in order to help with retention, in order to help with recruitment, having conversations with your existing employees about what they like about working at your organization, what has kept them there for 10, 15 years or two years, what benefits do they like, what special things do they enjoy that you do at your company. And what we call these, and again, these can be stay interviews. It's just you're interviewing and you're talking with your people about what they like. We've seen a lot of organizations that are conducting employee surveys. And when I say that, I don't want you to think that you're sitting and talking with each individual person. We can do that, but having a third party come in and have it be anonymous where they can just answer a few questions can then give you, the business owners, the opportunity to really hear from your people. Are you focusing your dollars in the right place? Are you really paying for benefits that they utilize and like? Is there something maybe that you can offer differently? Um, is there an extra floating holiday that you could put in as, as, uh, as an incentive? Do you need to look at your vacation plan and determine is that competitive from a tenure perspective? So there's a lot of different discussions and information that can come out of those surveys. And we found the companies that we've worked with, again, the employees value that ability to share that information anonymously, again, so it's also important that you provide that feedback to them. So if anyone does have questions on how to do that, please let me know. I'm happy to talk about that as well. And as we talked about, um, we already talked through that piece. So one of the other pieces of retention is looking at, as we've gone through the last year and a half, two years, a lot of organizations have changed the structure of their workday. They have maybe gone down to four days a week versus five, 10 hour shifts versus eight, and just trying to do different types of structured work days. 
And some organizations, obviously manufacturing does not have the, the ability to have your production lines be done remotely, but if there are certain key positions that can be done remotely, some organizations are adopting that remote and hybrid work schedules. But from a manufacturing perspective, there's opportunities for you to work with the existing employees that you have and utilize job sharing, job rotation, job skills updates. So these are, are resources that employers can use to, again, provide the value of the employees that are doing these jobs to share what they're doing. And that job sharing also helps with having more individuals trained and qualified in those key roles. So if you do have individuals that are leaving, you have someone that's trained to be able to take their spot. So there's a lot of different options from the resources and uh, the cross-training perspective. I have a lot of companies that say, you know, I'm trying to get the product out the door. I don't have time to train people. And we understand that's definitely, yeah, getting your productivity out and getting your product out to your customer is the biggest, the biggest priority for you. Um, however, you want to be sure, again, that you have employees that are able to produce for you and also are able to produce a quality product. So being able to have the training and that skills and job sharing also helps to ensure your workforce has a consistent product that's going out the door as well. Has anyone done anything in their organization similar to what we've talked about, job sharing, changed your jobs, your work schedule, anything like that? Yeah, okay. Everything, <laughs> okay. Okay, so another big part of coming out of um, the last year and a half, two years, um, I always say I wouldn't be an HR person if I didn't talk about compliance, and that leads us into employee handbooks and policies that are needed for your compliance as an employer. And we always talk with organizations about, they call the handbook Exhibit A. For example, if there's any type of legal issue or lawsuit or claim that's filed, the attorneys are gonna say, Exhibit A is gonna be your employee handbook. And if you as an organization don't have one, that can be a risk for you. We also wanna share that the employee handbooks do not need to be 500 pages long. They can be short, to the point, be a reflection of your organization, show your mission, talk about the history of your company, talk about the structure that is needed for different types of programs that you have. And it can be something that's very simple to do. So a lot of organizations maybe have a handbook where they say, I haven't updated it in the last 10 years. So there's definitely compliance updates that you do wanna be sure that are in there. So you know, there's opportunities to help you with updating your handbook or starting from, from scratch as well. And these are processes that will definitely help mitigate risk to your organization as you grow. So what should some of those policies be in your handbook that you should focus on, that you want to ensure are there to help with any, any further um, risk? Attendance is a big piece. Paid time off, how are individuals able to take vacation days? How are they able to take them in conjunction with a leave if they're taking a leave of absence? If you're an organization that has 50 or more employees and fall within the criteria to offer the family medical leave, how does that impact your leave of absences if someone's taking short-term disability? How does all of that play together? We mentioned before the remote and hybrid policies. If you have any individuals or administration that are working remotely, ensuring that there's a remote workplace agreement and a policy in place for those roles as well. And the Department of Labor has a number of policies that fall under their guidelines, including payroll, overtime, how is your work structured, looking at the work schedule of your, of your day, being sure that's outlined in your handbook, outlining how the overtime is paid from those regulations, and really having a structure of, if someone were to come in and say, tell me about your payroll process, you can say, here's our policies that we follow as an initial start. 
And one of the other big policies and a lot of concern from organizations focuses around employee safety. And not only employee safety in reference to machinery or chemicals that they're working with, but the workplace safety and the violence of a workplace accident or having someone you know, come in from the outside and um, have some type of an assault. There's a lot of organizations now that have seen workplace shootings, that have seen um, a lot of violence. So it's important that you protect your employees and have a procedure in place of how to handle those type of situations. Also from a workplace safety perspective, what happens if there's a tornado or if there's um, a pandemic or a catastrophic event that happens? There needs to be policies in place so your people know what is, what is there to help keep them safe, okay? Um, I want to talk a little bit more about, about the Department of Labor and the, and the pieces of the payroll process in your handbook. It's important that you have outlined your different level of employees from exempt to non-exempt employees and how you have them classified. The Department of Labor is out doing, and I can, they will continue to do more audits in the workplace as it relates to compensation, as it relates to overtime, as it relates to the payroll process and how you have individuals classified. So that's important to do, and that's, again, something we can look through you know, with you. Do you have just all hourly people? Do you have salary? Do you have some that are salaried exempt? So having those classified correctly can also ensure that your organization is mitigating any risk as well. Americans with Disabilities Act is another policy. Obviously, if you're a company that is 25 or, or 25 employees or higher, this is one that we're seeing a lot of litigation on right now that is continuing to move forward um, with claims in the workplace, not only statewide, but also within the state of Ohio. So we, employees need to know that there's a policy in place. And the Americans with Disabilities Act basically covers individuals that would have serious health conditions or disabilities. Religious accommodation is all part of that as well. So there's different parts of this particular policy that's very important to have in place. In addition to having in place the interactive process if someone comes to you and says, I'm unable to do my job because of A, B, and C. So best practice to have that outlined in there as well. The next one is one of my favorite ones, and I'm sure everyone has heard of the I-9 form. Has everyone heard of the I-9 form? Yes? Okay. So the I-9 is the form that is required for employers to have on file for all employees that were hired after 1986. You're responsible as an employer to keep them on file for all active employees and also keep them on file for any terminated employees for up to three years after their termination date or last day worked, whichever is later. Department of Immigration has actually hired over 2,000 auditors to go out into the state starting January 1st. And I've heard that that number is to double within the next two to three months. So what does that mean for you as an employer? What that means is you should be ready to have an audit at some point. Um, and the best practice is to be compliant and be proactive and say, here's our process for our I-9s. Here's how they're completed. Here's how they're stored. Here's our retention schedule for that. This is actually um, an opportunity that we've helped a lot of clients with to really be able to document that you have these done that you also have the documentation with them and help kind of talk through the best practices for that process. And I do want to share the fines for this because this is very important. Um, an average fine for just one incident on one I-9 form can start from $250 to up to $3,000. Now there's a whole separate level if you as an employer are fined because you willingly hired people that are not able to work in the United States, 
those fines, as you can see from that bottom line, can go all the way up to 11,000 per incident. And it's also important too that when they're reviewing the forms, that if they come in one time and say, here's the recommendations of what you need to do and how you need to move forward, you can guarantee they're gonna come back and look and see, are you consistent? And if you have a re recurrence of the same errors, those fines are tripled. I've seen some organizations, even here locally, that have had both an immigration audit, a Department of Labor audit, and an OSHA audit all within three months. So, and I, and I don't want to scare you, but I do want to scare you. So you're aware that, again, the Department of Immigration is the most active at this point with the I-9 and the audits. So even if you have 25 people, or you have five people, or you have 500, you still need to have these forms. So if there are any questions about this process, um, and just a discussion with you of, let's talk through what your process is so we can identify, is there some opportunity to help you move through that? Any questions? Okay, did I scare everyone? <laughs> Um, and again, we just say this as a resource for you, so you know, and I've had people say, well, we're a small, you know, we're, we're Ohio, or we're Holmes County, or we're, you know, New Philadelphia, Dover, nobody's going to come to our area. Yes, they will, because how they look at how they schedule some of those audits is they look at, there's a main interstate 77 that goes all the way through Ohio. So when they schedule their audits, they want to be sure that wherever they're going, they can get the most audits within their time frame. So they can look at, oh, here's Dover and Philly. We can get off this exit and we can do these manufacturers. We can go down 39 and do these manufacturers, these businesses. So it's very, very important that, that this is done. So workplace trends. What, what do we see as HR for what's in the future? And what do we still need to be focused on? Um, a lot of organizations are continuing to work through COVID and any particular type of policies as it relates to COVID and keeping their workplaces safe. Um, as again, I mentioned HR compliance with heightened awareness. There is also, again, a lot of litigation that is starting as a result from reductions in workforce and terminations from the pandemic. So it's important that organizations are thinking about and ensuring that age discrimination, harassment, ADA, all of these, I call them HR terms, are, are in your mind and are at the top of your radar um, because we only expect that these cases and these clients and these, excuse me, claims will continue to, to move forward. Um, it only takes one employee that maybe is upset about something um, to, to start an EEO process or file a claim. And again, we're seeing a lot of increases in those types of um, workplace reviews as well. So radar items, what should we be thinking about? You as a business owner, obviously, you're thinking about getting your product out the door, getting people to make your product, getting your people to stay. Um, as part of that process, what should you be thinking about moving into the new year? And what topics are other HR and other organizations looking at? And that includes, as we talked about before, employment compensation and benefits, really looking at your packages to determine that you are competitive in the area. Looking at reskilling and training your employees is another uh, big topic and a very important part. Employee engagement is also a very hot topic, uh, keeping your employees engaged, keeping them retained, also looking at the ability to gain more communication from them. We talked about workplace safety as, as a big piece of, of information moving forward. Diversity and inclusion is another big topic. And employee wellness, your employees' well-being, your employees' families' well-being, taking care of your employee as a whole. Um, there's different wellness options, different types of programs that are coming out that employers can look at as well. 
And we really you know, advise you to talk to your insurance brokers and work with them about what resources and help are part of your, part of your plan from an insurance perspective to help your employees. And some of these options are free. So really just being able to share what some of those options and resources are, are helpful. That was a lot of information, and I'm sure there's some questions. Does anyone have a question? The yes, sir. Mm -hmm. What's the latest opinion? Well, <laughs> that is still up in the air at this point. So we, at this point, we are awaiting guidance from, from President and the Congress on what the actual mandate is and what is the time frame, and how does that look for employers. So we really don't know anything more than we knew a couple weeks ago. What we are telling employers is be prepared for some type of vaccine mandate policy. We just don't know the extent of what that's gonna be until this plan is laid out. Um, we've heard that um, there's been a lot of movement in the last couple days. So we're hoping that there's something that comes forward at some point next week. Um, Congress will actually be leaving for their holiday break in mid-November. So it, something needs to be done and sent out to employers by then. And a lot of that focuses around if there is a vaccine mandate, how do we implement it? How do we implement on-site testing? How does employers pay for that if they even are required to do that? Again, it's still at that 100 employee and above, but that could change too. So. We're just kind of waiting. So as we know more, we'll share it. We'll put it out on our resource page and talk with, with everyone as well. Good question. Very popular question. I'm sure there has to be other questions. Everybody's like, Renee, you scared me. I don't want to talk anymore. <laughs> yes. Um, there is obviously... Um, we're having a hard time hire, hiring people. Mm -hmm. but it feels like, uh, like where did we go? I mean, people couldn't have just left the workforce. Yeah. So where where is it be at? I, I mean, surely, mm -hmm. like the, the unemployment rate looks super low. Right. So they have to be somewhere. That's a great question. Did everyone hear his question? Where are all the people? Where they go? Um, it, it's not just one source. I mean, not one reason. There's a lot of a lot of issues in reference to that. So you look at, first of all, you look at the number of students that are going into certain types of work outside of high school when they graduate. They're not going into trade positions or they're not going into professional positions. So there's a gap there. There's a gap with people that are retiring as well. So you have them out of the workforce. There's the gap of um, caregivers with uh, children that have not gone back into the workforce that maybe were uh, employed by the retail or the hospitality industry that saw huge decreases in, in their employee and their jobs. So they have not gone back into the workforce. So there's a lot of pieces and parts that are kind of adding to that as it all funnels down. Um, I hear, we hear that all the time, and I even think that too. It's like, where, where is everyone? You know, there were a lot of people that were on unemployment, and having that you know, be taken back and back to where it normally was, um, some employees, again, are still on that unemployment, and some are going to be for a while because maybe their business is closed or they're not reopening, so they can make more staying home collecting that unemployment than they can before they go out back to work. Does that help? Yep. Good question. One of the things as an employer too for you to keep in mind in reference to unemployment, if you see, as I mentioned, the frauds that come through, look at the statement that you get monthly as well that will have who is being charged, who you're being charged for from an unemployment perspective. You can also be charged for an employee that maybe is not even there anymore that worked at another organization. And that time that they worked with you filters into that factor of how much their unemployment is. So really look at that, that chart and be sure you're aware of what you're paying for and who you're paying for. And also as an employer, if you have someone that you did have that you placed on layoff um, and you want them to come back to work and they refuse, 
you do have the ability to go back into that unemployment claim and state that we offered a job to this person and they rescinded and then that is something that will take that person off of unemployment after it goes through the process. Any other questions? Okay. If you do have questions, please feel free. Um, email me, give me a call. I'm here the rest of the morning. Um, we appreciate your time. I know this is a lot of information. I wish I had the answers to everything, um, but we can definitely share the resources. And the biggest thing is helping you mitigate the risk to your organization and taking care of your people. All right, I think we're good to go here. So we'll go ahead and get started again. Uh, for those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet, uh, my name is Andrew Geyser. And I just want to touch on a little bit what Dustin said and just say that I'm quite frankly honored and thrilled to be taking over the manufacturing segment for Rain Associates. Uh, if there's anything that I think we learned through the pandemic is that manufacturing is vitally important to our success as a uh, state, as a nation. And so to just be a very, very, very tiny, small part of that is, is truly a privilege. So uh, with me today is Rochelle Morrison, and we're just going to talk a little bit about, you know, costs and what we're seeing from that standpoint, as I'm sure everybody in this room has dealt with rising costs on multiple fronts uh, really since the pandemic started. And so talk through a little bit that for anybody who may have heard me talk, it's been a couple of years ago now, the first part of this might feel fairly basic and almost like a review as we cover you know, different types of costs. And then towards the end, we'll get, get into a little bit more of what we're seeing um, currently and some of the pitfalls that uh, we see when we go in and we're, we're looking at costs for folks. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rochelle. So if you're wondering why my name on the screen does not match what Andrew just introduced me as, I just got married. So my last name is now a mouthful, Rochelle Lewandowski. Still learning how to spell my own last name, but <laughs> could barely fit it on my name tag. <laughs> um, so starting off, understanding your costs. Typically, we like to think of costs in these four buckets, um, materials, labor, overhead, and distribution costs. So starting with your materials, most people have a pretty good handle on what their materials cost them. Um, but some things to consider would be freight in, including freight in on your material cost, as well as maybe scrap. So in the normal production process, there is waste of a lot of your raw materials. So if you have a good system to track what that waste is, it might be a good idea to build in a scrap factor on your materials when costing your product. Um, so a good way to look at that is if you're running and then at the end of a run, you should have this much on hand the next time you go to produce of a raw material, but you're always short, that might be a good indicator of, hey, it's time to evaluate what my scrap is, build this into my cost. Um, the next bucket is direct labor. So think all personnel costs associated with production wages. Um, and when I say production wages, that's people actually on the line producing the product or out providing the service. So shipping labor is included in the distribution bucket or admin wages or management salary, that would be in your overhead bucket. So on top of the wages for your production employees, it's also good to consider fringes, so think insurance, if you offer 401k, all of those benefits that your employees incur, as well as payroll taxes. So building those into your direct labor when costing your product. I'm gonna skip to distribution then. Distribution are all costs required to move your product to the customer. Um, so think freight out and shipping labor. And then lastly, overhead is pretty much everything else. So every other expense on your P&L, your profit and loss statement, that does not fall into one of the other categories is considered overhead. So think depreciation, rent, utilities, the admin salaries that we talked about earlier. Um, so we typically start off when we're working with the client, take a look at their P&L, break the costs into these four buckets, and then we can then assign those costs to the product. All right, so you've probably heard many different words to describe costs. So you probably have direct versus indirect, which Rochelle's gonna to touch on in a bit. You might've heard product costs versus period costs, inventoryable costs versus non-inventoryable costs. There's a lot of different words that are out there. Um, a lot of those types of distinctions are centered around how costs ultimately end up in inventory and then are expensed out through cost of goods sold. But one of the other areas we wanted to focus on was fixed versus variable costs. And 
These don't necessarily show up in a profit and loss statement that often. Um, I have seen some folks that do break them up in a profit and loss uh, with these, these distinctions. But the reason we wanted to touch on this is these are be, this becomes vitally important as we talk about capacity issues, um, whether or not maybe you're not at capacity, and really what it takes to um, keep a facility open and running versus maybe not. So we're not gonna just touch on it here real quick. So from a fixed cost standpoint, those are costs that are um, consistent really despite the level of activity that you have. So whether or not you produce 10,000 units or 30,000 units of whatever you're doing, those costs will probably stay fairly stagnant. And some of those are depreciation, management and administrative wages, rent, um, could be advertising, although advertising could be a little bit variable, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. Uh, but for the most part, they stay the same regardless of activity level. On the other hand, variable costs vary, hence the name variable, with however, whatever the activity level is. So the most common one here is materials. Because obviously, you can't really produce more product without more raw materials. So that's kind of the, the main one there. Direct labor tends to be one that I think uh, historically was, was mostly variable, although with the change in processes and the advancement of technology and automation and the way that's being factored into production processes, uh, we are seeing some direct labor being treated more as fixed uh, by people when they're looking at costs. So it's up here with variable, um, but as kind of my bottom bullet point shows there, you know, many in reality, many of these costs share tendencies of both. And so it's really just good to have an understanding of what those are. Other than direct uh, labor, materials, uh, materials, utilities tend to be more variable, um, especially as running processes, you know, obviously eats up more energy. Uh, repairs and maintenance usually, usually is fairly variable, it's running, running equipment more, um, takes more repairs, and then also production supplies. And so, the main, important, the main reason why understanding these can be important is the, this is how, um, when companies talk about looking at their break even point, this is really what they're talking about. So, a lot of people like to know, well, at what point am I breaking even? And I know I've got my costs covered and everything after that is gravy on top or whatever you want to call it. And really, it's hard to know that without understanding fixed versus variable. Because uh, by definition, break even point is that point at which um, you have your sales price minus your variable costs that, that go up and down uh, with your production and that, then that margin that's on there, a lot of times referred to as contribution margin, when you have enough of that there to cover all of your fixed costs, that's when, that's when the break even point happens. So um, as folks have been looking at, you know, not, definitely not so much anymore um, with, with most, most companies being running close at or near capacity, but coming through the pandemic and you know, people were having to shut down, looking at you know, what does it cost me just to open the, open the doors and turn the lights on, that kind of thing, uh, this became vitally important. So. so direct versus indirect costs then. Um, direct costs, think of all costs directly tied to a product. So your materials, your labor, your manufacturing supplies. Um, so for example, I love ice cream, ice cream connoisseur. So let's, let's say that you produce ice cream. Um, you're looking at what is my cost of a tub of mint chocolate chip ice cream. So you've got your milk, you know you need this much milk in it, it costs this much per gallon of milk. You can tie that directly to this tub of ice cream. You've got your chocolate chips, you got all that, all that good stuff. And then let's say it takes two hours to produce this tub of ice cream. So your labor costs, you pay people this much per hour, then you have your fringes, payroll taxes. You can say two hours of labor, I can tie it directly to this tub of ice cream. But then you know you have all these other costs that it takes to produce that tub of ice cream that maybe are a little bit harder to trace directly to that one tub. So those would be your indirect costs. So they do not have a direct relationship to the product. Like I said, therefore it's difficult to know how much to assign to each product. Um, so think utilities, um, think management wages, think depreciation. How are you gonna assign, I have a $1,500 utility bill, how am I gonna assign how much of that utility should go to this one tub of ice cream? So that's where Andrew's gonna talk about how do we assign these indirect costs that are harder to trace 
to our products. All right, and so as you can see, there's quite a bit on this slide, and, and really at the end of the day, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road, and it's, it's about trying to figure out, we've got all these costs, and how much does it cost it to, per, per piece or per unit? And so I'm gonna try to walk through this as best I can, um, but there is a lot, kind of a lot to unpack here. So as Rochelle mentioned earlier, you know, uh, when we get questions on this, and we're, we're looking at this for, for different people, uh, the first thing we'll do is look at the P&L and break costs up into, into those four buckets. Sometimes we only do three. Um, it really kind of depends on the specific um, company or the specific process as to what is best. Um, and that's kind of one thing to keep in mind too is with this is n unfortunately none of it's really an absolute. And so a lot of it's trying to figure out how, how you manage costs and what makes sense. So looking and breaking it up between what's materials, direct labor, overhead, and then potentially distribution. Um, after we do that, then the next step can be, it may not be in simpler processes where we may be able to go straight from those groupings to, to start looking at you know, what's the cost per, per unit. For any company that has multiple product lines, uh, departments, or business units, however you look at it, really the next step then is taking, taking costs and, and getting them separated out between those, those um, breakouts or, or unit, business units, whatever you call them. Because if you don't do that, then it's really pretty difficult to figure out how much cost a certain uh, unit of product is, is absorbing, uh, so to speak, from each department. So. That this is where it can get a little tricky too with how do we do it and do we have the data necessary to do it. Um, but in general, when looking at costs and we have different departments or different business units, you know, and, and breaking them up across those, the best, the best thing is always if you've got actual costs that you know this goes to my custom department versus this, this cost goes to my maybe more of my high volume department. Um, anytime you have actuals from that standpoint, that's always best. Um, but I'm sure everybody knows is there's a lot of costs that aren't actual and that are shared across multiple departments. So really the question is, what do we do then? And that's when we have to start looking at allocating them and coming up with a reasonable and as, as reasonable methodology for allocating those costs across departments. So we can kind of know, well, what are the costs of my custom department versus my, my high volume department? And so there's a multiple plethora of different ways to do this. Um, some of the key, key um, allocation drivers that we've seen and that seem to work well are as a percentage of sales, um, square footage of a facility, maybe something for depreciation or utilities, you know, how much square footage of your facility does a certain department use. Um, labor hours, so we work, maybe it's a kind of a labor a cost that's somewhat associated with labor, so we allocate based on the labor hours in the department, or in the, the, there's also other ones, but those are kind of tend to be the ones that we see used most often, because number one, there a lot of costs do follow those types of methodologies, and usually the data is available because you have labor hours because you have pay, you have to do payroll. Uh, square footage is usually fairly easy to obtain, so um, those tend to be what we see there. Once we get to a point where we've got costs, you know, broken up into different buckets, and whether it's you know the materials, labor, overhead, distribution, and then maybe potentially once again across departments, now it's about finding out how do we get those costs to our specific products. And this is where really understanding your processes comes in um, and what's driving those processes. So I think historically, you know, a lot of it was labor hours. You have a production line, you have employees in general, you add some employees, you probably get more output. And that's still the case for a lot of uh, companies today. However, with the advancement of technology and more equipment, uh, high-powered equipment being used on production lines that are essentially controlling the output, 
that's coming out of out of production, uh, we're seeing machine hours being used for this. And really, at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're taking our bucket of costs, you know, that we have broken up, and dividing those by, you know, whatever cost driver is relevant. So we've got hundred thousand dollars of cost um, of, of overhead for this department, and we determine that labor hours is the most appropriate cost driver, and we've got 100,000 labor hours. You know, that's really nice and easy for us there. So we know every hour of labor should probably absorb about $1. So kind of coming up with those rates of this is how much it costs me, you know, per hour, whether it's a labor hour or a machine hour, and how much does it cost me um, for that is kind of the next step coming up with those rates. And then the final step here is really making sure to understand throughput and how fast can you actually produce whatever you're producing. Because that's then ultimately going to determine what that cost per piece is. So we know it costs us $1 per hour uh, in overhead and we can make one unit in one hour, then it's probably appropriate to say that that unit should take $1 of overhead um, in its cost. So, and it's overall cost. So really, that's kind of how we get there. So we start, we break the costs up from the P&L, uh, making sure we're trying to be as um, detailed as possible without killing ourselves in the details, which can happen, and that's kind of a watch out with some of this. Um, so break them up and then figure out what our cost drivers are you know, come up with our rates and then then assign those to our products based off of throughput. So not saying every single company should or does follow that, but this tends to be the general process um, that we see. And the bottom point there, I think is probably one of the most important is what is the main driver of your process and making sure you understand that um, you take employees away from the production line does output significantly drop because they're not physically there doing the work? Or can you take some employees away and, you know, maybe for an hour or two and output will pretty much stay the same because you, machines are kind of controlling you. And that's kind of the way I like to think about it and I try to get, to get folks to think about it. So we want to talk through the three main issues that we're hearing from our clients when you're asking them, hey, what's going on? These are the three big repeat offenders. So labor shortages, as Renee already talked about this morning, um, rising material costs, and then supply chain disruptions. So we're going to start out with labor shortages. Um, wages are increasing. In order to get people in the door, and then also to maintain that wage gap, so your starting wage is now higher, but the people that have been here for 20 years, they want an increase too because they don't want to be at the same rate as someone that just came in. So wages are increasing, but are you accounting for this in your costs and updating your cost assumptions? Um, not only, it, maybe you give a 10% wage increase, but you also need to think there's 7.65% payroll tax on that. If you have a 401k plan and you're matching 3%, there's another additional cost. So in thinking wage increases, it's not just, oh, I gave a $2 wage increase, let's account for this. It's all the other costs that go along with that. So just thinking through, as you're updating these things, I should be updating this and reflecting this in my costing, or else it's going to be a hit to your bottom line. So in order to maintain your margins, you want to account for these sorts of things. Um, secondly, maybe it's time to evaluate if there's areas in your process that you can automate. So if you take some time, look through your processes and see, I've got a lot of labor hours tied up in this one process. Maybe I should, maybe it's time to invest in technology and see if I can automate it because I don't have enough, I don't have enough people right now so that time could be used somewhere else more efficiently. So thinking about maybe it's time to automate. And then lastly, maybe you're running more overtime. You used to run five days a week and now you have to run Saturdays to keep up with demand. Are you accounting for that additional overtime when costing your product? Um, as I said earlier, just maintaining your margins, thinking through as things are always changing, as my assumptions are always changing, making sure you're getting that included in your cost. All right, the next one I think is probably gonna be something that I think everybody's dealt with over the past you know, year and a half, and that's rising material costs. 
uh, which, you know, in talking with, with folks and seeing some of the percentage increases, whether it's on the lumber side or the steel side, is really quite crazy um, what people have been dealing with. Um, and so, yeah, really, material costs have skyrocketed, you know, due to many reasons, whether it's increased demand, whether it's because of supply issues coming out of some of the, the uh, lockdowns and uh, stay-at-home orders that were, were put in place when, this, when the whole COVID thing started. Um, one thing that we saw with regard to that was really interesting was as different states approach their essential versus non-essential businesses differently, um, that really threw the supply chain uh, haywire. And you know, to give an example, I know we have a client, actually it's out towards the Lima area that was deemed essential here in Ohio. Had they been in PA, they would have 100% been non-essential and had to shut down. So just that stark difference between the states really, really threw things for a loop. And so the main thing that we're seeing folks struggle with right now with regard to this is figuring out a way to get these rising material costs um, into their cost assumptions and ultimately their pricing models um, to make sure they're being covered. And so um, to make it even worse is we're seeing, you know, long lead times for everything. So for instance, you know, your lead times might be out three, four, five times what they were, um, you know, pre-COVID as well as there's longer lead times to get materials in the door. So, you know, and there's a lot of change that can happen in those. So, you know, you might be quoting something or trying to put some cost assumptions together for product that you may not actually produce for another couple months. You might not order the raw materials for another month or two, um, which gives a lot of time for prices on those to fluctuate. And so to combat this, we're seeing a lot of surcharges. We're seeing just quite frankly, a lot of contingencies with pricing. Um, just because it's in, in a lot of ways, it's just not fair to have to quote something today that um, you really have no clue what that price is going to be when you ultimately go to order it and finally get it, pay for it, and then actually produce it, ship it out to your customer, and then get paid. So really, it's just trying to, to do the best we can to monitor what those are and when we can. Uh, a lot of folks, yeah, putting contingencies and surcharges in place. Uh, to try to protect themselves and do what they can in this area. And, you know, really, at the end of the day, you know, I think, I don't really think anybody likes to do a price increase, um, but we're almost forced to, because if we're not passing along material price increases, that means either A, we're, we're having to find it somewhere else in our operations and our processes and our organization, or it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact our bottom line and take it out of there. So. From the standpoint of looking at margins and trying to maintain those, um, it really almost does become a necessity as we try to combat you know, these rising prices and, and figure out what's going on. So the last one, Andrew kind of touched on some of these points, but just the disruptions in the supply chain. So as he talked, not only are material prices increasing, they're also taking longer to arrive. So quoting farther out, maybe ordering more at a time, so thinking of cash flow, um, or just higher distribution costs as well, accounting for the higher distribution costs into your um, costing model. So maybe you're currently struggling to keep up with demand. So how do you evaluate which jobs to go after? If I have all these orders and I can't fill them all, which one makes most sense for me to fulfill? Which service makes most sense for me to go out there and work on? Um, so one metric that you could use is gross margin per hour. Um, so I'm going to start with gross profit per hour. Sorry, net profit per hour. If you know what you want your desired net profit to be, and then you can divide it over your billable hours, get to a net profit per hour. This is my desired net profit per hour. Then you could add back in your overhead costs, overhead costs per hour, to get to your gross profit per hour. You can multiply that gross profit per hour by the estimated hours that it takes to complete that job, add in your direct costs, labor and materials. This is the price that you should be charging. That's your pricing that you want in order to maintain that net profit per hour or that gross profit per hour. So if you're looking at different jobs and you know I can price this one and it meets my gross profit per hour number that I'm trying to get to, 
but I can't price this job at that, maybe you go after the one that's above or at your gross profit per hour number that you're looking for. So that's a good way to look at how do I evaluate which job to go after. It also just helps you maybe look at your labor productivity. So if you have different crews and you're quoting at a certain estimated hours for a job, and you're, then you can start to see this crew's always meeting it and I'm always getting my net profit that I want from this crew, but maybe this crew is taking longer. And you can see some of those um, instances as well when you're using this metric. Or you could have different net profit per hour based on what services you provide. So for example, let's say um, if you're an electrician and you're installing generators, maybe you want a $50 per hour net profit margin um, if you're going out and servicing a generator, but you want $200 if you're installing a generator. So you can kind of look at pricing in that way too. And then lastly, maybe just evaluating your current ERP system. Or if you don't have a current ERP system, maybe implementing one. So that can help you track your um, product all the way through the process from beginning to end, help you with scheduling, forecasting, what do I have out there currently versus what inventory I have on hand? Um, how far out do I need to order? So if you don't currently have an ERP system, maybe it's time to implement one to help with some of these supply chain disruptions and manage everything that's going on. I think one just thing, one thing to add on the whole ERP thing, um, you know, managing costs is difficult, but you can't manage what you can't measure, and that's really what Mm -hmm. what an ERP will help you with, what it would help with is being able to track the costs uh, and the activities necessary to, to manage costs um, at, at whatever level of detail that you need. So a lot of the other questions that we're getting is pricing, um, it's pricing center. When do I raise prices? Or how do I know how much to raise? Um, those types of things. And so really kind of one of the first things you know, we try to talk through is, you know, do we understand what costs are? Because ultimately costs are gonna impact our pricing and making sure that we understand those costs so we can price appropriately, make sure we're not too high, but for sure make sure we're not too low. And so, you know, really make, understanding and assigning costs of products is critical here to make sure we know, you know, when we might need to pull the trigger on a price increase. One of the biggest gaps that we see as we look at this is that not all costs are being covered in a pricing model. Um, and whether that's due to maybe some outdated assumptions or just not being aware of it, um, we tend to find, I, I like to call it leakage, um, somewhere in the process and costs that are not being accounted for. Um, and that's really why, as Rochelle said at the very beginning, we start there with the PL because that the PL will not lie. Um, it, it, it's those costs are what they are and that's what we know it's there so having seen having those gaps is one of the biggest things that we see and so really the questions to think about you know when looking at pricing is you know what margin do you want or maybe what margin do you need you know to, in order to have the profit needed to service debt or to give the return to shareholders or owners that you want whatever the case may be is what are those margins and how, how tightly are we going to stick to those before, you know, are we going to let some, some margin creep take place before we pull the trigger on a price increase? And just kind of coming up with what's your appetite for that, for that margin creep and, and losing it versus before pulling the trigger, or is it something we have to have these margins? And if that's the case, then it probably means that prices are going to have to be increased. Another thing that's good to think about is what's the industry standard? Um, this is good to know how you compare uh, with an industry, but um, the, one, the one watch out I would say is, you know, businesses come in all different sizes, even within the same industry. And so some of those industry metrics can be skewed a little bit um, and might be more for a very large organization or that's where the data is coming from because they report their data versus maybe a smaller organization. So I, I would just caution because I have seen folks use this um, in specifically their costing and it got them in trouble a little bit. So just making sure that it's not the end all be all, uh, but that it is good to monitor so you kind of know where you stack up. Um, what is capacity? So basically, am I at capacity? And I have to start looking at different jobs kind of as Rochelle was talking about, 
and look, potentially looking at profitability you know, for different jobs and where can I maximize that? Or do I have capacity where I can you know, maybe keep the status quo, get some more work and drive some volume? So um, really just understanding where you're at there. Um, I would say I think a lot of folks that I've talked to are at or near capacity um, because of the labor shortage and you know, material issues and getting that in. Uh, but maybe that's um, that's not the case for everybody. You know, should I would highly suspect that there's not many people offering a lot of volume discounts right now. But if you're at a point where maybe you do have capacity, you know, maybe that's something you want to look at. Um, at least something to keep in the back of your mind as a tool, if needed, to help drive some revenue. And then one of the big ones too is at the end of the day, you know, the numbers can tell you that you need to increase prices, but you know, you really want to make sure you maintain good relationships with your customers. So understanding how they're going to react to it. Um, I think in this day and age, quite frankly, a lot of people are trained, almost trained at this point to expect price increases as, you know, it's very, everybody's aware of the supply chain issues and rising costs. Uh, but just making sure, talking through and understanding how they're going to receive those and that it's not going to potentially damage a relationship over over a price increase that you know maybe you can withstand, maybe you can't. So really just making sure taking care of uh, customers in that way. So we wanted to go through, we're both going to go through a couple of common costing pitfalls that we see when clients come in asking us for help and we're reviewing what they're currently doing. These are some of the things that we're seeing and we're not saying absolutely don't ever do any of these. These might work for some people, but this is just what we're seeing and some of the issues that we've dealt with. So first of all, inaccurate books and records. So as we said a couple of times now, we usually start with the P&L. So if you have a P&L that's not very clean and your expenses aren't in the right account, they're kind of everywhere, garbage in, garbage out. You're not going to get a good analysis out of that if we don't start with good data. Um, secondly, just doing a broad application of assumptions and not checking those assumptions. So for example, the last project that I worked on, um, a client was applying overhead as a percentage of materials and labor. They were using 25%. And then they were also, when they were pricing, royalties were 11% of sales. Sales commission was 1% of sales. So the first thing I did was took their P&L from last year and just checked those out. What actually is overhead as a percentage of labor and materials? It was actually much higher, it was at 40%. So they were way under costing their product. Um, just looking at your assumptions, um, we have up here, avoid just saying Sally. Sally stands for same as last year. So if someone were to ask you, you have assumptions in your pricing model. If someone were to ask you, where did this assumption come from? Um, if your answer is this is how we've always done it, I would just challenge you to go out there and find the right answer and find, you know, where did this number come from? Does it make sense? Does it need updated? So really challenge yourself um, to get out there and understand those assumptions that you're building into your pricing model. And honestly, um, we see a lot where things just maybe haven't been updated. We would recommend updating your costing and pricing model every year. Things are changing rapidly right now. Um, so getting some of these things that are ever changing into your cost is really important. Um, also, the Social Security adjustment, the cost of living adjustment is going to be 5.9% in 2022. So that's just a great indicator of how much things are changing over time. This is the largest adjustment since 1982. Um, so if that doesn't show that inflation is real um, and that these things need to be updated and built in in your costs, um, super important. Next, using a percentage of materials for allocating your overhead. Um, so we see this a lot, but what I wanted to explain was if you're, let's say, a furniture manufacturer and you manufacture tables and you manufacture chairs and you're kind of evaluating the profit of each one, let's say the cost of the wood for your table is super expensive, high material costs, but it only takes you two hours to make that table. So then let's say the chair is a super inexpensive material cost for the wood, but it takes you 15 hours to make that chair really intricate design, maybe it's a custom. If you're applying overhead based on your material cost, your table is gonna get most of that overhead. Even though your chair takes 15 hours to produce, taking up more of your time, energy, resources, the table only takes two hours to produce, it's going based on material cost. So it might not be an accurate, accurate depiction of what um, cost your products are actually absorbing. 
And then lastly, not considering non-productive hours or applying an efficiency percentage. So labor hours are a lot of times used as a cost driver, as Andrew talked about earlier. Um, and in the gross profit per hour example I gave, I said dividing over net billable hours. So then when you're pricing your product, you're thinking, okay, how long does it take me to provide this service or to produce this product? But when you're creating your cost drivers and dri dividing over labor hours, there's a lot of extra hours in there that maybe aren't necessarily spent producing your product or providing the service. So think um, meetings. If you have a team meeting every morning, uh, if you have to clean up after you're done producing, you have to clean the line, or if you're providing a service drive time, all of those hours that are built into your labor rate are non are hours that you're not actually spent producing and therefore you're under costing your product. So when you go to price, you're pricing based on actual hours spent producing. Um, so we typically start with 80%, reduce your labor hours by 80%. Not that you're inefficient, but when you start thinking about it, just take, if I have an eight hour shift, just start backing out time in a day that typically employees aren't producing. 30 minute meeting, an hour for cleanup, and get what that efficiency percentage should be for you. Yeah, and just to put the the cola increase percentage in perspective, if if, if say we make we make the assumption that that's inflation, and your net bottom line is fifteen percent, and you experience that across your costs, and you don't do anything, it's going to erode your bottom line to about ten percent, which I mean, not really a surprise when you think about the number there. But that's you know that's cutting a third of your profit out of out of out of your uh, out of your business. So. Really, just making sure we're, we're continually looking at this and taking into account these increases. Uh, some other common pitfalls is, you know, improper assignment of costs to product or product lines. Once again, this is usually due to outdated assumptions that aren't being checked. Um, maybe, maybe your business has changed over the past five years um, as far as mix goes, and so just not not making um, changes to some of those assumptions. Uh, Sometimes we're seeing incorrect cost drivers. So um, kind of as Rochelle said, whether it's using kind of material costs to put that overhead and labor on there or, or something else that might not be reflective of your process and how costs are actually being incurred. Uh, another one here uh, is, is I talked a little bit about actual, using actual expenses versus allocating when we can. Um, just seeing some allocation methods that aren't reflective of, of those costs as well. Um, an example of that, uh, when I was at, Dustin mentioned that I was a smucker and I was there, we had a product line that quite frankly was not um, getting the cost assigned to it that it should have, and it was a small part of the business. Um, and once we flushed it out, um, this was at, at the plant I was at, once we flushed that out, it was a matter of a year or so, and that product line was no more because all of a sudden, when we still, when we were able to dig in and find the actuals and realize what these actual costs are, um, it was pretty eye-opening to see uh, what the performance was. And yeah, really, potential consequences are just that: um, improper allocation of resources, improper pricing, um, whether it's pricing too low or potentially pricing too high and pricing yourself out of business or out of work. Um, and products and product lines can appear more profitable than they are. And then, you know, lastly, and this is, you know, kind of the, the worst case scenario here is just that the fact that incorrect business decisions are being made. Um, numbers will drive, usually can drive a lot of the decisions. You know, I don't think it's good to make every decision with the numbers, uh, but a lot of times they will support and be a good guide um, from that standpoint. And if, if we're not looking at that, then incorrect decisions could be made. Okay, I'm going to go through this one kind of quick so we have time for questions, but what's the point of all this? Why should you take the time to understand, to assign your costs, to look at your pricing model, update assumptions, what's the point? Um, so some benefits of understanding and allocating your costs correctly is accurate financial reporting um, and therefore accurate information that you can make sound business decisions on because you're comfortable and you know that it's right. Um, so like whether or not to accept a new order, as Andrew just talked about, whether or not maybe to discontinue a product line or add a new product line. Um, knowing your profitability of each department and also knowing the cost at each stage of your process. Um, so that could also help with like a make versus buy decision if you know your costs at each stage. And then lastly, just being able to appropri appropriately distribute your resources, your time and energy to where you think it will provide the most value.
All right, I think this is our final slide here. So just kind of where to start. So let's say you're kind of swimming, not really knowing, well, what do I even do? How do I even go about this? So I would say the first thing is, you know, monitor and understand your processes. Um, understand what's controlling it. Um, and under, like basically, is it, is it the labor side or is it more of a machine? That way we know, you know, from that standpoint, do we have the data necessary to support some of this? Um, and that's kind of my last point up there too. Uh, but yeah, just monitor your processes. And then, you know, really, you can't really update your assumptions if you don't know what they are. So I would say document your assumptions. So go to your, go to however it is you price your product. And what are the assumptions in there that we're making as we do this? Or, you know, I'm sure there's probably tribal assumptions that are just talked about throughout the day. You know, oh, we know, we know this is this, or we think this is so much per hour. You know, what are those? Document them and then go check them, um, kind of as Rochelle was saying. But we can't, we can't really check it if we don't know what we're doing. Um, understanding, you know, your P&L and the expenses on it. So, you know, what, what are your expense accounts? Um, maybe you're not much of a financial person. So taking the time to understand what those are and what actual expenses and actual costs are going into those accounts. Um, so you can kind of know how, how you want to look at those. Uh, Look at different cost drivers, kind of as I said, is it labor driven, machine driven, um, and allocation methods that you might currently be using. Um, because yeah, as, as the bottom point it reiterates there, and I think I mentioned earlier, it takes data to do this, and maybe you don't have the processes to collect that data now, but um, maybe we maybe set something up and figure out well, how, do we, how do we track so we can actually have a definitive number if we produce this this number of this product um, this week and this day um, in the past, so we can we can start to look at some of this. So I think that that's pretty much all we had. I know that was a lot, and we went feels like at least to me we went through it pretty fast. So if I just want to open it up for any questions that somebody might have right now, um, or yeah, we'll both be around later too. So if there's any questions right now. Um, I'll, I'll take them. I guess I would have a question. How do you uh, factor in uh, your terms on, on receivables and payables, uh, inventory terms, and of course, obsolescence and materials? So, so from an obsolescence standpoint, you know, that's once something becomes obsolete, that's, a, that's a, a cost there, and that can kind of go into what Rochelle talked about, the scrap factor, um, being built into that, or just you know trying to get a handle on, you know in general, we've experienced this much obsolescence in the past, and, and having that built into our material costs. Um, as far as inventory terms go, receivables and payables, um, that, that tends to be more of a cash flow Thing, as opposed to a necessary, necessarily a costing and a pricing component. Um, but I will say what, what we normally like to see is once, once you kind of have a handle on costs and pricing, um, is then understanding you know, how that impacts your receivables and, and payables and that kind of stuff. So. Andrew, some of the issues that, that we experience is capturing accurate data points to plug into the costing models. Mm -hmm. it, uh, any help there? I mean, relying on people to fill out time cards, understanding the importance of it, I mean, this just doesn't seem to work. We're going to have to automate something. Yeah, no, and that's, and I would say first, you're not alone in that. That tends to be the biggest issue that we, we see as well, is just getting that accurate data off the production floor. I would say what I see a lot of folks doing is going as much as they can to barcode scanners or um, photo eyes, anything like that to automatically count stuff as it's moving through a process at a certain point and trying to feed that into, whether it's into, into simply a spreadsheet at first or act directly into a system. It's, it's just trying to, to take, that, take the human element away, I would say. Um, because nothing against people, but you know, there's a lot of mistakes that are made. Um, but I, a lot of guns or 
whether it's the mobile handheld scanners, maybe similar to this, trying to, if, if we do need people to do it, make it as absolutely as easily as possible as we can for them to do it. That, that's what I see a lot of folks doing. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, our next presenters are going to be Heather McNichols and Michelle Thompson, who are part of our what we call our CAS group, um, Client Advisory Services. And really, they're going to kick off uh, the next three sessions are all going to be uh, fairly rela related from the standpoint of, you know, we hear all the time about the labor shortage on the production floor, but there's also, you know, labor shortage, you know, in back office um, situations as well. So, you know, the next three sessions are really geared towards hopefully giving you some ideas of what can be done uh, from that standpoint uh, to streamline, you know, back office processes and um, cut out cut out hours that may not be productive. So with that, I'll turn it over to them. All right, fantastic. I wanna thank you for allowing us to spend a little bit of your morning with you. Um, we are, as Andrew mentioned, part of the client advisory team, and we spend a lot of time helping clients either utilize some of these accounting applications or implement them in our, their business. So we're gonna just talk through some of the most popular ones and why they might make sense for you. We're going to kind of center the entire conversation around QuickBooks Online. This is one of our favorite applications because it's affordable, it's easy to use, and it integrates with so many other programs. So we're going to talk about Bill.com and how it integrates with QuickBooks Online. We're going to talk about some inventory solutions. We're gonna talk a little bit about converting your QuickBooks Online, or your QuickBooks desktop to QuickBooks Online because we know that's where traditionally a lot of people are sitting are on the desktop version. And then we'll turn it over to Michelle and she's gonna talk about some of the key features in QuickBooks Online, such as bank feeds, some of the reporting options, and then we'll leave it open for some questions. So bill.com, what is that? It's a solution for your accounts, pay, accounts payable needs. So as we've been talking a lot about the labor shortage, bill.com can make your accounts payable division in your business a lot more streamlined. It can help move things along. And as was mentioned in the last presentation, it can take some of the user error out of your accounting process. So what are the great features in, in bill.com? It allows for separation of duties. So a lot of times you have a small accounting firm or department and one person does everything. Well, we all know traditionally that's maybe not the best process. So bill.com will allow one person in your accounting department to enter bills, code them, do those pieces. It will allow a second person with a different role to actually approve those before they're paid. So you have that separation. You have two people looking at it. It links directly to QuickBooks Online. Why is that important? It takes out double entry. So I'm not entering things into bill.com and then turning around and having to put them in QuickBooks again. They talk to each other. And they talk to each other multiple times throughout the day. So it's not even a button I have to push. It's just connecting. And if I change something in QuickBooks Online, so I have vendor information and I update that vendor information, it syncs over to bill.com. If I'm in bill.com and I change vendor information or add a bill or pay a bill, it goes over to QuickBooks Online. They talk back and forth. There's electronic document storage. So how many of us in the room have a storage room, a storage shed somewhere with boxes upon boxes of invoices that we have to keep for seven years. Bill.com is gonna keep all of those electronically. You can get rid of the boxes. If you want a hard or a file because you just don't trust that Bill.com is holding on to it all, you can pay and have them send you, I want all my invoices for 2021. And they'll save them to PDF and and you then have a copy of that. Your checks and payments are written from bill.com's account, not your account. Keeping your bank account clean. 
Who loves filing unclaimed funds reports? No one. <laughs> so all these checks are now on Bill.com's account. And if somebody doesn't cash them, they're Bill.com's problem. They will contact the vendor. They will work with you to get, make sure that those get cashed in a timely manner. What happens in your bank account is a single direct or draw comes out of your bank account for all the checks that you pay on a single day. So instead of having 35 entries that you're going through and reconciling at the end of the month, you've got one amount that came out from bill.com. And then bill.com paid your 30 vendors. And bill.com is starting to use artificial intelligence to reduce the data input. I've been using bill.com for probably close to three years now, this is the feature that I'm the most excited about. I have an invoice that I've dropped into bill.com and it's a vendor I've never used before. So, okay, I've got to, now I've got to enter their name, I've got to enter their address, all this information. If it's on the PDF of the invoice, bill.com starts to pick that up and I just have to check it. Yep, that's the right name, that's the right address. Yep, that's their phone number. Same thing once I start using the same vendor over and over. Oh, this is my office, you know, staples I buy office supplies from. Next time a staples invoice comes through, it's already coded to office supplies. I'm just looking at it saying, yep, that's the right amount that bill.com picked up off the invoice. And I hit save and my job's done. So this can be a huge efficiency saver for you. What's more is, you know, we mentioned this is web-based. I can access bill.com from any device with a web browser. I can access it from my computer at work. I can access it from my computer at home. I can access it from an app on my phone. So if that approver that you have is always on the go, they're never in the office. Many people tell you that about me. They can never find me because I'm always somewhere. Somebody can just say to me simply, hey, you've got invoices, which actually bill.com is gonna send me a reminder that says I have invoices that need to be approved. And I can pull out my phone and I can swipe. Yep, that one's approved. Nope, I don't know. Wow, I don't know what this invoice is. I can push a button on my phone and see a picture of that invoice without having to call anyone, without having to ask for a copy of the invoice. I'm taking care of it all right there. Oh, that makes sense, now I saw it, yep. If I have a question on something, I can send a question to the person that entered it through to bill.com and then they can respond to me right there. So why, again, why use bill.com? The ability to make current staff more efficient so talents are used elsewhere. We've talked so much today about shortage, talent shortage in the workplace. These programs can make it so that maybe your accounting staff can take on more responsibility. Maybe you lose somebody and you have to spread their duties among more people. If we add the efficiencies, that doesn't become such a burden. One of the best examples that I like to use in this instance is I had a client call me one day and she was calling me because they needed an accounts payable person. It had been her responsibility and she had just been stretched too thin and she had been given the approval to find somebody to take over that role. And she wanted to know if I knew anybody that might fit. I said, I'm sorry I don't, but have you ever thought about using bill.com? And we talked through how the program worked, what efficiencies that it brought to the table, and they ended up not needing an extra person. Bill.com built in enough efficiencies for her that she wasn't stretched as far as she used to be. She wasn't having to sit there any longer and match the check stub to the check invoice and staple it and file it because Bill.com was doing all of that for her. Reviewers, as I mentioned, they have access to the invoices right there within the program, wherever they're using it from. So instead of, um, so often what I see people that are going through the approval step, they get a list of unpaid bills. So if something doesn't look right on that list, they're having to call the accounts payable person and say, hey, you know, this bill, 
you know, again, using Staples. Staples looks really high this month. Can, can you get me a copy of it so I can see what's on there? Instead of that circle going around, they can just pull up the invoice and look at it themselves. The access from anywhere, you know, again, that's a huge feature, especially, you know, if the past year and a half has taught us anything, it's that we sometimes need to be flexible and we may have to move quickly or work from places that we hadn't planned on working from, and Bill.com allows that. A lot of people called me during you know, the pandemic when they were getting shut down and were frustrated because their check stock was sitting somewhere. They needed to find a way to print their checks, and then they had to get them to somebody else that had to sign them because they weren't a signer on the account. So they were driving across town because they weren't working in the office and the person that signed them needed to pick them up. People using Bill.com had no interruption. They just kept hitting those buttons from wherever they were. And there's also multiple user settings to allow proper access to proper individuals. So honestly, the reason I started the conversation with that client early or in the um, presentation was because she was concerned about bringing on this new accounts payable person, and she didn't want them to have access to QuickBooks. And I said, well, if we use bill.com, they only need access to bill.com. It talks to QuickBooks. You maintain everything in QuickBooks. They don't even have to have it log in. And that was why the conversation started was because of that user privilege and making sure that the right people were in the right places. So that's an accounts payable solution. Then we're gonna, you know, what about inventory? We're at manufacturing day, inventory is important. We all know that the inventory in QuickBooks is somewhat limited. The inventory in QuickBooks Online is even more limited. So this is where one of these applications come into play. These are a couple of them that we've used in the past or we've had clients utilize. I'm not gonna get into all the details on the inventory programs because they are very specific to what the needs are of the company. So we would need to look at, or you would need to look at, okay, this is what we need our inventory program to do, and then, then we look at the programs and see what makes sense. But these two, I know for a fact, integrate right in with QuickBooks Online. So again, I can get the functionality that I need for my inventory, but I can also not have to do double entry and have to make adjustments in QuickBooks. It's doing everything for me behind the scenes. What I always tell people is I like, I like for you to think of a wheel. QuickBooks Online is in the center of that wheel and all your applications become those spokes out around the wheel. So you have bill.com that's feeding in. You can have Fishbowl as your inventory solution and that starts feeding in. Maybe you work with Paychex for your payroll. Paychex has a direct link with QuickBooks Online that your payroll can be pushed into QuickBooks with just a push of a button. All of these things feed in and then you're managing QuickBooks. You're not entering all these things and you're not having user enter error. I don't know about you, but I have a lot of times when I hit that number and you know I miss, miss the number I'm going for or I transpose it, the computer's pushing that through. I'm not having to have those errors. So again, like I mentioned earlier, I know that a lot of us are on desktop. You know, that was popular. That's what was out there. What does it take to get to QuickBooks Online? Well, in my mind, there's really two different ways to convert to QuickBooks Online. There's what I'm calling the full conversion. So basically, everything that's in your desktop version goes into QuickBooks Online, all your history and everything like that. But before you take that step, it's important to identify if your desktop file is a good candidate for this. You can do that because files can be too big. Sometimes they don't convert well if they're too large. Um, earlier, Rochelle made reference to a term that I actually had in my notes, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> so if you have a 25-year-old QuickBooks file that somebody started and had no clue what they're doing, do you want that history in your new file? Maybe not. 
So identify if, if the conversion, if your file is a good fit. Identify what information may need to be added manually. So I always tell people, let's look at that first, not because we can't do it, but because we don't like surprises. So an example of this are um, estimates. Estimates have to be entered manually when you do a conversion. So I just want to know, am I going to have to convert 1,000 estimates? Again, it's not, it's not going to hold anything up. I just want to know. And sometimes it's part of a process of, oh, I have 1,000 estimates, but I really know that only 200 of them are active, and maybe those are all I need. You know, you might take a closer look if you know what needs to be done manually. And then the third step is to go through the conversion process itself. But if you're not a fit for the full conversion, there's what I call a limited conversion. So with a limited conversion, we can export lists out of QuickBooks Online, or QuickBooks Desktop, clean them up. So if you have, you know, again, garbage in, garbage out. So if you want to go in and change the formatting on your customers, or you want to take out old customers, you can do that in Excel. And then we import it into QuickBooks Online. So you have clean information going into the system. Step two, then, is entering beginning balances. So you pick a date. I'm going to convert my file as of December 31st. I'm going to start the new file clean on January 1st. So I enter those beginning balances. This is where I was at on December 31st. So January 1, here I go. And now I'm going to move forward. So you're not going to have the history, but you're going to have a clean file. And you can always maintain your desktop file as a backup for that history if you need to. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, and she is going to go through some of the features of QuickBooks Online. All right. Thank you, Heather. Oh. Uh, as you can see, Heather can tell countless stories about clients that she's been able to help with these different applications that link with QuickBooks and work alongside QuickBooks. So I highly encourage everyone here to talk with her after or I'm going to fly through a couple of my slides. We'll have time for some questions after that. Um, but please ask. This, this can be highly valuable to, to many of you here in this room. Uh, so, so key features. It's, it'd be impossible for me to stand up here and, and talk about all the features of QuickBooks. Um, you know, like Heather mentioned in um, her, her presentation with Bill.com, QuickBooks Online is just that. It's online. I have access to the internet, if I have access to a web browser, I can access my accounting records. I don't have to worry about connecting to a VPN, I don't have to worry about slow speeds, etc. This, this will function at your standard internet speeds and just like if you were reading something on Google. Um, what I do want to focus on is a couple of my favorite features uh, within QuickBooks Online, with the first being bank feeds. So QuickBooks Online offers a direct connection between your bank and your QuickBooks file. So let's say you bank with Huntington. Within a few clicks of the mouse, your checking account, savings accounts, credit cards, CDs, etc., whatever accounts you have can be directly integrated into your QuickBooks file, with, again, with a click of a button. So all my transactions happen throughout the day. I go in the next day and I can see them all populated there. So wh what does that allow me to do? Well, a as we know, cash is a key indicator in most of our businesses, right? So cash in, cash out. This is gonna, going to allow for most of our reporting, most of what goes into our financial statements and how it gets categorized. So with if I'm capturing all that cash through a direct connection of my bank, I know that at the end of the month, when I go to reconcile my bank account, it's literally going to be checking boxes because I see a transaction come through the bank. I know it's in my, in my file. So directly from the bank to our QuickBooks feeds, to our bank reconciliation, which means our financial reports are accurate. Now with the bank feeds, um, our clients generally take one of two steps. Some clients 
will use an add function, which means I am adding everything directly as it comes through the bank. So I'm not worrying about going in when the, when the transaction actually occurs. I'm worried about it when it comes through the bank. So I might process a bill payment or an, an invoice or my, my revenue as it comes through the bank feed on that day. Other clients like to add it on the back end, which we probably recommend, quite honestly, where they're entering the invoices, they're entering the cash receipts, they're entering the bills, they're entering the bill payments, and when it comes through the bank, it's a simple match. QuickBooks, again, allows these three options. You can add it, you can match it. I'm not gonna go through exclude because it's rarely used, in my opinion. Um, but again, at the click of a button, these are all generated directly to your general ledger. A lot of what we talked about is, the whole purpose for doing this is accurate financial statements. So I'm gonna continue with the theme, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> You've heard it a few times now, right? So if we don't put in the accurate information, we go to report at the end of the month or the end of the quarter or the end of the year, the financials aren't going to tell us anything. We wanna use this information to tell a story. Tell a story about our business. Tell a story about you know the ins and the outs, where our cash went, how our cash was used, et cetera. And QuickBooks, QuickBooks allows a couple different options for this. So standard reports, uh, there's, I'm not exactly sure how many, but a couple handfuls of just standard reports that are within QuickBooks Online. You know, you can run a standard profit and loss statement, you can run a standard balance sheet, cash flow statement, vendor list, client list, and, and the list really goes on and on. And again, with the click of a button or the adjustment of a date based on the period that you want to capture, that information is available to you. One of the really cool things that I love about uh, QuickBooks Online is the custom reporting. Um, I'm a geek. I'm an accountant, I love numbers, and I, I think one disconnect and one thing that I'm very passionate about is helping, helping our clients understand those numbers because how many times have you looked at a piece of paper and you're like, okay, I, I have no idea. I have no idea what any of this means. Help, help me explain it. Or how many times have you manually been using a calculator on the side to calculate maybe the change over year over year or the percentage change or dollar change or whatever. What custom reporting allows us to do is, is to make those reports so that they are, are automatic, so that they do become one of those standard reports. We're able to export it to Excel. We can add the columns in that we want. So if you wanna see a year over year change, and a dollar by dollar change for the period. We can add those columns in, save it. Next time you wanna use it, just like the standard reports, at the click of a button, it's available for your use. Um, there's also, you know, we talked about bill.com, we talked about Fishbowl, Paychecks, other apps that integrate with, with QuickBooks Online. There's also reporting apps. Uh, there's a couple examples, Fathom, QVinci that allow even more robust reporting. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, maybe you don't understand all the numbers on a piece of paper, on a cash flow statement, or on a pro profit and loss and, and how they work together. What, what some of these applications allow is, you know, maybe a dashboard that shows your, your key metrics, your key performance indicators. Um, the, the numbers, Again, what's useful to you? Everybody in here probably uses their numbers for a different purpose. And that's what these, this reporting feature really allows is for you to report and gather the information in a quick and efficient manner based on how you want to use it to run your business. Because the last thing we want you all to do is to spend your time in the numbers. We want you to spend your time on what you're passionate about, right? You're passionate about your business and how your business operates and what you can do to make it better. 
So, so these easy applications, um, you know, QuickBooks Online, and like I said, even again with more robust reporting and Fathom and Cubinci, allow that information to be available to you in, in a very quick manner. Uh, the last thing, the last thing I want to mention here, and uh, again, it all comes back to efficiencies and everything. But directly out of QuickBooks Online, you can you can deliver the financials maybe to a CEO or you know somebody else, a vendor if needed, a bank, etc. Um, you can actually email them directly out of QuickBooks Online. So gone are the days of save as, put it on my desktop, open up an email add it add it into my email and send it away that can actually be sent you know with a couple clicks of the mouse again just a couple you know an extra minutes of savings every minute here with all these savings and efficiencies that we've talked about obviously add up over the course of time um, and allow you the time to get back to again what you're passionate about and what you love and that is your business so that is that is all i have um, I think we have probably, well, we're running short on time, but if we have a couple questions, if we allow time for that. Okay. Yeah. Is Bill.com compatible with other platforms? It, it is. Some of them are not as seamless. So sometimes there's a connector that you have to have that you manually have to do the connection between the programs, but there are other applications that it works with. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is there is a website out there because there are hundreds upon hundreds of applications that work with QuickBooks Online. So we've got our contact information on here. If you're interested in what else might work with QuickBooks Online, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to share that information with you in that link. Anything else? All right, thank you so much. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started here again. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, kind of the next two speakers together uh, because the topics are very closely aligned and they might you know, go back and forth a little bit. So the first one's gonna be Dave Rowe and he's a principal with Rowe & Company. And Dave has helped a lot of small, medium-sized businesses navigate this area of ERP selection. What do I do? How do I do it? Um, and that kind of thing. So he's going to talk about that. And then the other individual up here is Cheryl Koblenz. Um, I'm sure there's quite a few in here that know, know Cheryl. Uh, she's the Director of Accounting Services here at Ray and has uh, helped a number of Ray clients as well as been um, in private industry, work through ERP implementations. So they're going to cover those two topics and talk a little bit about uh, what some of their thoughts are. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is David Rowe, as, uh, as Andrew's mentioned. Uh, I also see um, some clients in the room, too, that have been part of um, some of our journeys through performance improvement in the past. So thrilled to see you this morning and look forward to talking to you about the subject of ERP. Um, and if you've heard this before, just bear with us for, for 20, 30 minutes, and, and we'll go on to the next subject. But, so let's talk about ERP. <clears throat> I uh, want to cover a few things. First of all, what is ERP? And I think by me seeing the ladies uh, present earlier, I think obviously you've got a, a good idea of what ERP is. Uh, but do you need a new one, or should you select perhaps a first-time ERP system? Um, I'd like to also talk about how to select commercial software. There's other ways to do this as well. You could build your own. You could have a staff of IT people build out an ERP system, but most people in this day and age choose to utilize commercial software that's on the market. Um, and then at the end, hopefully we can have a couple questions and answers. So with that, <clears throat> ERP software, <clears throat> excuse me, stands for Enterprise Resource Planning. So that means the breadth of your organization. It means everything from product, items, bills and material, through sales, purchasing, manufacturing, warehousing. A, a big push, of course, in today's day and age is e-commerce and bringing in orders and communicating with your customers through portals. Back out the warehouse once you have an order and then your back office activities as well. So 
that's kind of the functional area in play when we speak of the term ERP systems. Some of you may be on some of the software you see above. I know the ladies talked about earlier about QuickBooks. Obviously, that's a, a big package for the, the small market growing companies. Um, other products that are out there, Sage products, Great Plains, and even an interesting one on the left you might recognize, Microsoft Excel, um, believe it or not. No offense to anybody as well. <clears throat> what do you think of when you hear ERP systems? And, and maybe by a show of hands, how many people currently operate what they would call an ERP system in their organization today? So, quasi, <laughs> something like that. Okay, is there any reaction when you hear the term ERP system? Do you have a positive reaction? Do you have a negative reaction? An I don't know reaction? A lot of those questions. Difficult to implement and maintain. Very good point. Other things? Expensive. Expensive, indeed. Other things, this side of the room? Indifferent, perhaps? Let's, let's go ahead and move on. There's a comedian out there by the name of Jeff Foxworthy. Not sure if, if you know who he is. Some of you may, some of you may not. But he had a real clever skit. Um, he used to say things like, if you were an XYZ, you might be a redneck. So it was a real clever, funny skit. I really think this is an interesting area for me to talk to you about ERP systems and, and the need potentially for new ERP software. So I'm gonna kind of do a little takeoff of his skit. If you think ERP system is Excel, you might be ready for a new ERP system. If you use old versions of QuickBooks, Great Plains, or Sage, you might be ready for a new ERP system. If you rely on spreadsheets and workarounds, you might be ready for a new ERP system. If you don't know what it truly costs to make your products, you might need a new ERP system. If you can't get the variety and type of reports and information you need in real time, you might need a new ERP system. If you have excessive manual processes and duplicated data, you might need a new ERP system. If you lack the financial visibility to drive your decision making, you might need a new ERP system. And I could go through all these in detail, <clears throat> but for instance, has your accountant come to you saying, I can't go on anymore with this system? you might need a new ERP system. So that's kind of the, the skit that I'm throwing at you, hopefully to, to liven things up a little bit. Do any of those things strike you as things that might be going on within your organization? Perhaps, yes, no? Okay. I bet there are, I bet there are some. So how do you approach selecting commercial software? And commercial software is one way to go about this. Again, you could, you could hire a lot of IT people and they could build it from scratch. That's, that's another way to do it. However, most people look at ex external commercial software to drive their businesses. How do you go about that? There's, there's four major steps that I like to advocate. The first of which is defining your requirements. So taking a look at your organization, what its current state is, its processes, its flows, where do you have issues, what are your requirements to go forward? That's what we call the requirements definition phase in the upper left. And the second part of that is to develop a request for quote to the vendors and develop a script, a demonstration script. So the script would be used to give to the vendors so when they come in and talk to you about their software, they're all talking about the same thing, apples for apples, as opposed to the sexy things they want to show you only. And you can really get to the bottom line of what you want to look at. The request for a quote is, is a, a package to have them come back to you with adequate pricing, implementation costs, etc. So those are some of the, the things that you do gather. The third item is the demonstration itself. So having the vendors demonstrate their software, 
Um, obviously with COVID, a lot of that's been happen, happening remotely. In the past, vendors have come on site and they've, they've done their demonstration. It's been very effective. But in light of COVID, a lot of this has been occurring totally over the web, which is fine. It, it typically works out pretty well. People can get a good idea. But it is starting to come back around where companies are opening their doors a little bit more after hopefully COVID is disappearing on us and uh, actually having the vendors come in house for those demonstrations. And that's where you really wanna scrutinize the software and match that up, of course, to your requirements. Lastly is to step back from the demonstrations and evaluate everything you've heard. Um, gather the costs, look at those side by side, try to get things as apples to apples as you can, and look at what the numbers tell you. Look at what the, because uh, I heard the, the comment earlier about it being expensive, it can be. You have to look at the full return on investment of something like this, how it's going to improve your business, increase sales, increase productivity, other things of that nature. Types of software selection approaches. I advocate about four different types with this, this matrix here. Um, with larger companies, oftentimes we do extremely detailed requirements definitions. With smaller organizations, we oftentimes can get away with less uh, because they're just not as complex as other, other um, organizations. So this is just a grid that I, I utilize with my clients to help guide how much consulting effort they should require. And that's what I have here along the bottom. I, I can either be a light coach to an organization or I can do things almost exclusively in a vacuum or I can do things collectively with you and your team and come up with the, the, the conclusion. So there's a variety of, of ways to use a consultant for that. And then the, the level of depth is on this side of the grid. Um, at the top, like I said, is, is very much so a very, very detailed, it could last say three to four months of a process to get that accomplished. And then down here at the bottom, there's oftentimes the capability of actually just doing a fit to. If I can get to know your organization fairly rapidly, I can probably lead you to the one or two products that you'd probably like to look at, save you a lot of time. And as I kind of mentioned with some of the growing and mid-market companies in our area, I often gravitate down into this area for expediency and uh, efficiency with the clients that we can get to the bottom line fairly quickly and uh, make it economical for you. <clears throat> so how do you make a decision about a new ERP system? So there's a lot of things to consider. Features and functionality are the first thing in my mind, how that actually matches up to your requirements. However, there's a, a variety of other things that come into play. The viability of the vendor, how financially stable is the software company? Are they small? Do they have like two developers? Or are they like Microsoft and they have thousands? Um, how is their support? This is a big thing I, I hear uh, with a lot of companies in the area that they just can't get good support from their software vendor and that becomes a real, real issue. Availability of resources. This one's really key as well. Where will the resources be coming from physically or virtually to help you implement software? Um, I think it's really important oftentimes to have software consultants that are nearby probably within an hour or two drive. That's very effective. Most people like that. So that's a strong consideration as I guide companies in that direction. Organizationally, do you have an organization that's really ready for this change? Do they feel the pain's great enough to wanna to go through the pain of implementing a new software system to get to the other side and hopefully have a better work lifestyle? So that's a big consideration. Lastly would be um, total cost of ownership. You really have to add everything up from the software licensing or subscription costs to hardware if you're actually going to have the software on, on your servers. Um, also cloud, cloud situations as well, the subscription for the cloud and, and the upkeep of, of your staff. You know, how many people do you actually need to operate the software going forward?
So how do you go do it as well? So you need management that's bought into this. You need management that's going to drive it and provide leadership, show the way to the, the other people in the organization. But then you also need a project team that could be dedicated anywhere between 10 and 30% of their time to the project to make that effective. So you just have to plan for that. That's obviously a very important factor. And um, you hope to have buy-in from maybe six to eight individuals at least to be part of the project team as far as um, selecting new software. So here we go. So what are your thoughts? What, what, are you, what are you thinking about relative to ERP? What questions can I answer for you at this stage? Do you have any questions? I guess it was that complete. Um, just a little bit of background. Uh, Andrew mentioned that I am with Ray and Associates. Um, Dave and I have worked together both inside Ray and also when I was in industry um, with some software implementations. And so through that, we've kind of developed a good working relationship. Um, I, you know, Dave is much more familiar with the actual software um, and the range of what's available in the marketplace. I tend to sit a little bit more on the internal side, um, almost with project management and trying to figure out how do we implement. Um, there's a lot of decisions that need to happen inside the company, and so that's what uh, I've spent time doing with clients, and then also with the implementations that we've done that I've done uh, in the ten years that I was in industry. Um, real quick outline of where I'm headed. You know, they asked me to talk about what does ERP implementation look like. And I sat there and was like, well, you know, you all aren't sitting here having made a decision to implement a new software. So how do we, how, how do we figure out what's relevant for you? Um, so I took, kind of took the approach of if you were thinking about starting, these are some things to think about. And while we're specifically talking about ERP and kind of that full-fledged approach, I would say that a lot of these uh, things can be used whether you're using, maybe you have QuickBooks and you need to add a third party vendor. Um, even adding a sales management function, you know, any kind of software changes, uh, some of these decisions, some of setting up your team to succeed, um, these are all key to making that, su that successful. There are some terms that I'm going to use. Um, a lot of times if you're going to a full-fledged ERP or even having a third party app, you have consultants or trainers that know that software. And they're gonna sit outside the company. Um, they're gonna show you how does the software work. Most of them will tell you this is the software, how the software works. You need to figure out how you're going to apply it inside your company. And that's where a lot of the, I call it stress, but the decision making happens because you're, you're looking at the software and you're saying, okay, this is what the software does. This is our current processes. How do we make sure that our processes fit the software or the software fits our processes? So you will talk, help hear me talk about your implementation team. Um, usually when Dave helps with selection of a software, he also looks at who that implementation team is, who is that third party. That third party selection is critical. I don't care how good your software is. If you don't have a good implementation team, if you don't have a good implementation process, you're going to struggle with your software. And it's not gonna be a one month struggle, it's not gonna be a one year struggle. You will struggle with the software until you rectify some of those implementation decisions. Um, so now I get off my soapbox and I'll go back to my slides. But, um, so we're gonna kind of talk about what does it take to get started. Um, and then at the very end, we'll look at what does success look like. And I think that's self-apparent, but we'll talk through some of the things that I look at. Um, so I have this as defining goals. Dave talked about this as a transcript. Um, it's really important if you have a software or your, your current Excel files, QuickBooks, whatever you're using, if it's not meeting your needs, usually you know that, right? You, you know it's not meeting your needs. But it's also important to talk to your team members. This can be as complex or as simple as you need it to be. A lot of times the complexity increases as the size of the organization increases. 
So if you have, you know, if you're looking at less than 25 people, maybe it's giving them all a slip of paper and saying, hey, if you could design a software, if you could list what you want, go write down everything that would help you do your job better. And we start to co consolidate, because if you don't have it written down, it's hard to remember all of those things. You use that list of your goals that you'd like to have and give it to your vendors. Now you have something you can check the box. And you can say, OK, does it meet our requirements? The other thing I would say is, as you have your people and you're, you're writing down what you want with your software, I like to break it up in at least two buckets, sometimes three. What are the needs? What is critical to the way that we function? What would you like to have? What would improve efficiency? And then for some people, I say, we need the bell and whistle category. This is dreams. This is maybe future state. But you break up those things in those buckets. That way, when you're looking at your software, you can figure out, does it meet our core needs? And sometimes, what we'll see is organizations, they get so excited about a software that fits their wants, they forget to look at, does it actually meet the basic needs of the organization? Um, once you have that list, I say build a, figure out what is in, what your software absolutely needs to accomplish right now. Um, if you are looking at a full-fledged ERP system, you may have multiple phases. So we may say, OK, let's replace current state with a couple of added on features. But you need to clearly define what are you going to try to accomplish and build a fence around those goals and make sure your team as a whole knows what's in and what's out. And remind each other, no, we agreed that this thing that we would like to have, that's going to be a future state item. Because so often you will see projects have scope creep. You'll go down rabbit holes because you forgot to define what is in phase one fences and what's outside in the next state. Having this written down is critical. Um, because otherwise, we tend to forget about it. We think about what we're currently working on and forget about something that happens you know, once a month that causes a lot of stress. Um, and, and then you can refer back to it six months from now, three months from now, and make sure that you're still on target. So I talked about scope a little bit. And after I'd created these slides, I'm like, this might actually be under understanding complexity. If you have a software system right now that's not doing the job, it's probably because you don't have the right data in there, or maybe your software can't handle the right data. The more item, when you do a software conversion, you can either convert data, or you may need to create data. If during your software conversion, you're having to create data, it's not, it's not in the old system, and we can't simply take it to Excel and import it. Um, if you are doing your annual inventory count in Excel or on a piece of paper, I can tell you you're going to have to be talking about processes. You're going to have to be talking about inventory items. Probably means you need to be talking about bill of materials. That means that this project just became much more complex. It's still doable. But in my mind, it is helpful to think about those things so that you can think about how much stress or how much complexity are you ha adding to the project so that you know what kind of team resources you need. Um, if you are manufacturing, and right now, what you're building and the products that it takes to build those items are in somebody's head that's on the production line, somehow you're going to have to figure out how do you take that out of their head, put it into paper, and convert it into a software. And you probably are going to need to spend a lot of time talking about your processes and how does this actually happen? Well, he just knows how to do it. Well, the software won't just know how to do it. Um, so it just takes, it takes more conversation, it takes more time, and it takes more thought, thinking about it. Um, the other thing is it's real easy to think about the one client that we have to have a special bill of lading and spend a lot of time thinking about that one client. Well, if we only ship to that client once a month, maybe we don't spend a lot of time thinking about that situation. If we ship to that client every day, 
then yes, we definitely need to have that process defined. But focus on the 80% of your processes and make sure your software is working for those. Um, and stay within the fences. You're going to hear me talk about this. Anybody that has gone through software changes, process changes, scope creep is easy. And you really have to be conscious about making sure that you, you know what phase one looks like. There are times when it is appropriate to pull something that was in phase two into phase one. But you need to be very conscious that you are making that decision. I've also been through projects where we've actually narrowed the scope because we realized about halfway through that we were jeopardizing go live success if we kept it as big. With the team that we had, we needed to pull it in, uh, make phase one a little bit smaller, and push some things into phase two, and, and kind of break it up into a manageable, uh, manageable size. Uh, the next section is kind of about your team, um, understanding your culture and your organization. Good. Yeah. So the topic of organizational change, I'm not sure if that topic's been floated around or you've all heard it before. Just by a show of hands, has everybody heard the term organizational change management? Has anybody heard it? Maybe, maybe a couple people here and there. So I guess just a couple things. Obviously, we're giving you kind of a quick flyby on a lot of, lot of topics. But with organizational change management, it really boils down to three things. So if you come away, at least with these three items, I think you'd have a general idea of the organizational change management topic. The first is preparing for training of the end users. So concentrating seriously about the training effort that would be required, making sure the training is extremely adequate for a change like this or any change you're facing within the organization. So training is number one. Number two is communications. How do we communicate why we're doing this project or any change within the organization? It doesn't have to be software. It might be something else. It might be the way we're changing how we, we cost product or, or whatever. Or maybe we're merging with another company and, and that change needs to be managed. So communication of the change, the reasons why, all of those things need to ad be adequately handled. Lastly, it's a topic called organizational impacts. So understanding specifically where in the organization these changes are going to occur and planning for those. Do we need to hire new people to, to deliver the, this change? Do we need to upgrade their skills? Do we need to um, you know, have people get training outside of the organization to be capable? So all the organizational impacts um, need to be analyzed and, and actioned. So those three items, training, communications, organizational impacts. Okay. So we're gonna kind of talk about those again as well. Um, you know, when you look at who you have inside your organization um, and who is going to be on this project, it's very important to figure out what the different roles are. Who's your project lead? This might be the owner of the company in a, in a small to medium sized company, or you may have somebody else that takes on as project, uh, the project manager. We've heard the saying, if, no one, if everybody's in charge and nobody's responsible, make sure you define who's responsible for the overall project manager management, but then also define roles. Who's in charge of production? Who's in charge of purchasing? Um, they can absolutely pull other team members into that area, but somebody needs to be organizing it. Somebody needs to be making sure that our requirements are being met and that we've got the testing that we need. And so, so have those roles defined um, and so that everybody knows what role they're going to play. The other thing to take it to, as you start looking at roles, figure out what strengths you have, or maybe you have some gaps in your organization. If you have somebody brand new in the purchasing role that doesn't have a lot of experience, maybe you need to pair them up with somebody that may not do purchasing every day, but at least understands it and has, sometimes it's simply more life experience um, in that role. But, but look, at, look at your team and you know, take a pretty kind of honest, candid approach to what are their strengths, what are they, their weaknesses, what are you going to have to watch out for? Um, your IT, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about software, mm -hmm. so do you have IT resources internally 
or are you going to have to go externally and make sure that you've got a good third-party IT consultant that you can rely on that's going to um, help you navigate through some of these things that you forgot to ask about when we selected the software or the extra needs that come up when it's around hardware, sometimes for software implementations if we're talking about barcoding. Who's going to program those? Who's going to make sure they're compatible? Um, there are times that it works. We talked about the IT consultant as an outside third party. Um, this is where I've set in on the, on the team itself um, with some of our clients to actually help them walk through the implementation, whether it's making you know, manufacturing decisions. What do we include in the bill of materials? How do we structure inventory items? Or, yes, I'm an accountant, um, so maybe you ask somebody at Ray to help do testing around, you know, you know what your profit and loss should look like when it comes out the door, but do you really want to go back through and double check how it's posting and make sure your inventory is, you know, transferring appropriately through your general ledger? It's time consuming, and there's only a couple of us geeks that actually enjoy that type of stuff. Um. And, and Cheryl's bringing up a really good point here of, of that role, the role of someone like Cheryl and her team to be part of the ERP um, implementation because vendor resources, and, and no offense to them, they're really good people, they're smart, but they pretty much have blinders on when they go to implement software oftentimes. And, and someone like Cheryl and her team can get involved with the project and really bridge the gap between the software and the raw training that, that the vendor typically provides and the actual things you have to go do to make these systems work. So I just wanted to stress that, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> no, you're fine. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is we talk a lot about processes. So how do you do things? Questions are going to come up about, well, is this best practice? The vendors will tell you, well, this is what the software does, but now you need to figure out as an organization, what should we do? How does this work? And the, the vendors don't usually, they, they want to tell you what the software does. They don't advise you on processes. Um, you look around the room at most of the Rain Associates people here, we don't mind giving you their opinion. Um, and so we'll help you talk about those processes. Are there best practices that you can implement? One of the things that I, especially in smaller organizations, when we talk about roles, um, and I don't even know where this fits, but somewhere in the software implementation, please make sure you've got one or two Excel gurus. Most of this data is coming through Excel. If you have somebody that doesn't know, if most of your team doesn't know how to do basic Excel functionality, find somebody who can help you. It will make the transfer of data much easier. Sometimes we're talking about pulling data from multiple systems, making sure you can merge it into simple tables. Um, the vendors, the implementation team can help you with that, but they don't usually go into your old system and pull it out. So make sure you've got the Excel expertise that you need. Um, articulate team roles. You know your business culture. You know how you usually communicate as a team. When you're talking about a software implementation, it might be one of the larger projects that you take on. So making sure that your team works well together and is great at communicating is critical to this success. Um, you know, make sure that you set the expectation for candidness. You need people to speak up at this time. If they have questions or reservations, you need to hear those reservations when you're testing, not after you've gone live when they say, well, I wondered about that. You need to make sure that they understand that you expect them to speak up. You expect them to ask questions. There are times when you'll need to build consensus and you'll need to say, We're okay. I'm not sure about this, but we've talked about it. We know the risk we're going to go ahead and try this. The other thing, and this is kind of a lean um, principle, but what does silence mean? You know, in lean, we talk about silence as agreement. So if you're in a meeting and you don't speak up, in some settings, that is taken as, I'm OK with this. But I think it's really good just to articulate what are your expectations for your team members. Um, do you need to go around the room and get, yes, we're on board with this? Or um, is your culture such that you can expect that they will speak up if they have questions? And I know this is 
doesn't feel like it's ERP, right? It feels like basic team dynamics. Um, but a software implementation will put extra pressure on your team. And so it's critical that you've got good working dynamics. Um, and you know, I, I talk about silence as agreement. And we talked about knowing your team and evaluating strengths and weaknesses. If you are the project manager and you know you have team members that like to think about things, if you are making a critical decision, maybe you are figuring out if you're going to change scope, it is very appropriate to talk about the pros and cons of a decision and to say, OK, I need you to think about it. We're going to meet again tomorrow, and we're going to make the final decision. But that gives the team members that like to think about it a little bit of time to process. I'm one of those people. So I've had to learn in meetings, if, if the team leader doesn't do this automatically, I will speak up and say, hey, look, can we think about this overnight, especially if it's a large decision? We need to think about it, and I will give you my decision tomorrow. I'm not talking about delaying it two weeks, but sometimes you, need, you want to make sure that people have had time to think through um, and make sure everything makes sense. I'm going to spend a couple minutes. We talk, we, you know, this topic was entirely ERP implementation. Um, most vendors will have a model of an implementation that they like to go through. So they have a set way that they like to go through the process. There are some differences between different vendors. But for the most part, they're going to follow some similarities. So this is what, this is what I found with the actual software implementations that I've worked with. Um, you're going to spend the beginning, what seems like forever, talking about what is your current state. Um, if you're manufacturing a distribution, this absolutely needs to include walking the floor of your warehouse or your plant. We can talk about things, but if you've got a third party that's coming in and helping you, they need to know what they're talking about. If your accounting team typically sits in an office and has never walked the plant floor, they need to walk the plant floor. So when we talk about things, they can visualize where is this at. If we talk about moving this product from this line, from line A to line B, are we talking about 10 feet away? Are we talking about 100 yards? Some of those things are going to make differences huge differences in efficiency. So you're going to spend a lot of time talking about what are you currently doing, how are you doing it, who's doing it, and you really should be talking about why are you doing it. So you're defining your current state. This can be done. If it's not done as part of the selection, it definitely will be done, uh, need to be done as kind of the first step of the implementation. And then um, at some point, you want to see your software, right? You have done a demo, which should at least, you know, you, you should recognize the home screen. Maybe you should recognize what your sales orders look like. Uh, but you haven't actually navigated in it. So for some vendors, they will give you a test file with test data. Um, you know, for some reason, most vendors like to build bicycles. I don't know why. But um, so maybe you have a test file that walks through how do you build a bicycle, and you kind of test it in that environment. There are other vendors that will ask for samplings of your live data. So they'll ask for customer list. They'll ask for vendor list. If you have it, they're going to ask for your uh, inventory items and your bill of materials. That way, when you go in and start testing the system, you can pull the client that you know the name of. You can pull the item numbers that you're familiar with. Um, if you have costing data in the system, you can start to test that costing data. That might be really early on. As your implementation progresses, you will continue to have different versions, um, different copies of the same file, not versions, but different copies. So you're going to load your test data in. You're going to start to do some testing. You're going to try to break the system. Somebody's going to break in. So you create a new copy with clean data. You might change some background settings because, well, it didn't work the way we wanted to do. Maybe it didn't do planning correctly. Maybe it didn't uh, schedule production or, or schedule orders right. So you change some settings. You take your data, you retest. And, and you're going to have multiple versions of these testings going on. You may also have um, a test company that is only being used by one, um, one of your departments. Maybe, maybe costing is complicated for you. Um, 
and, and you want to really dig into costing, so you create a sample company that the, co the finance or production works together and really tests out co costing while holding everything else static so they can trace this, this information. So you're, you're going to spend a lot of time doing that testing um, as whether you're a department manager or a project manager, you want to make sure that you are testing as, mu as many of your transactions as you absolutely can. Back to that 80-20 rule, absolutely make sure that you are testing your major transactions. Um, and you will start really small. So you might start by entering a sales order. Then, okay, that works. I can actually enter a sales order. Can I ship that sales order? Okay, that works. So then we add steps to it. But you're going to start small, so you know your data entry might start with your sales entry. Your purchasing might start entering POs. And, and each department is kind of testing these different areas. And before go live, pretty long before go live, you need to start putting the, all these transactions together to make sure that when, sales order, when the sales order is entered, is it creating demand for the purchasing department? Is, if you're doing scheduling inside the system, is your production team able to see what needs to be scheduled? Needs to see the due, do they need to see the due dates that are out there? So you'll test, and you'll test, and then you'll test some more. And then you're, when you're really tired of it, you keep on testing. Um, but during that time, and again, this depends on the size of the organization, one of the things that testing does is you get real familiar with the software. If you have your managers um, doing most of the testing, at some point they need to start training the rest of their team. Because on go live date, everybody who touches a computer needs to know how to use that software. And so they need to be pretty functional at it, or that first day or two of go live becomes miserable. Um, so you're, you're going to be testing, um, and a lot of times the testing is paired with training at the same time. We didn't talk about this in the, um, in the team dynamics, but you know, talking to your leaders about positivity and um, understanding that this will be stressful and encouraging people we will get through it, figuring out what does your team value. Um, you see a lot of uh, companies bring in lots of lunches over an implementation, um, some extra perks, you know, maybe, maybe it's having snacks around that they don't usually have around. Um, just, just ways to help, um, how do people manage stress? What, what do they do uh, to make life a little bit easier? When we talked about the team, we talked about Excel. So about a week before go live, we kind of do a final data transfer from old softwares, old systems, old Excel files into a clean copy of your working uh, company. This, is, this happens in a really condensed time frame. So making sure you've got your strong Excel users, making sure you have the appropriate IT support, making sure that you have made plans on how you're going to get all that data and talk through it. Um, your vendors will help. You know, they're, they're going to ask who's doing it, how are you doing it, when are you doing it? Um, because you, know, you usually have just a couple of days to take all of this data that's in your old system and put it into a clean system. Sometimes that happens over a weekend. Some of this depends on your business structure and how complicated, or maybe how many transactions you're posting every month. Um, inventory, a lot of times you'll see a physical inventory that is done. You know, if go live is Monday, maybe you do a physical on Thursday or Friday, so that when you go live, you have good inventory counts, especially if you haven't been tracking inventory inside the system, this becomes even more critical. And then you have the morning when your staff rolls in and they may be able to log into the old system, but they're told not to enter any transactions and they have to figure, they have to, the, the rubber meets, meets the road and they're in the new system. And this is kind of the day that everybody panics about or stresses the most about. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, the aha, uh -huh. you know, has your planning worked? Are, have you tested well enough that your transactions will post? Um, are you able to get shipments out that day? From a expectation standpoint, one thing that I wish somebody would have told me before we started, your people that are posting transactions, they're going to figure out real quick if this is working. 
if they can't ship, if they can't enter production, they're going to know that first day. If you have people that are dealing with the purchasing side or customer service, customer service for sure, you know, the first three to four days, if they have customer service inquiries, they're going to rely on that old system because that data is still good. Customer calls in and wants to know what their AR balance is. Well, if it's Wednesday, there's a good chance the Friday AR balance is okay. So they're going to go to that old system. By the end of that week, then is when your customer service, your purchasing people are going to be, okay, can I rely on the data in this new system? Have we entered it correctly? Do I trust it? And is it reasonable? Your post go live adjustments, the magnitude of those are going to depend on how well your go live was, right? So expect to have some changes. Expect to say, oh, you know what? Maybe we need to tweak this a little bit. Maybe we need to enter it a little differently. That's okay. Know that you're going to have those. Make a list of those. Have a plan. Um, a lot of times your vendors will be on site right during go live. Maybe they'll have weekly follow-up meetings to handle some of these questions that come up. Sometimes they can wait. You know, if, if we're not quite sure how to do this, maybe a weekly meeting is okay. If you can't post, if you can't do manufacturing, if you can't do production, well then maybe, you know, that, that needs to be fixed right then. Um, so your, your post go live adjustments, I just kind of threw in there. Expect to have them. Plan, you know, test the, as if you want none, but the reality is you probably have some. So that's kind of a, that's what I found with, um, with Go Lives is kind of the, the process that we go through. Um, and then you've had Go Live, so what does success look like? You know what, you have a working software and your users, users know how to do it. To me, that's success. You know, if they, if they can get through that first week and we can post transactions, we can ship, we can receive payments, we can order our products, that, that's a pretty, we did, we did a good job. Um, but, you know, we have that written list of goals. Refer back to that. Did, did we hit those? What do we need to work on going forward? As a business manager, as an owner, do you now have better decision-making data? Um, depending what data you're looking at, it'll take you a little bit of time to figure that out, but watch those reports. Make sure they pass the common sense meter. Most of you know what your profits should be, most of you know, you know the reports that you're used to looking at. If they appear out of line, question. Ask, where is this coming from? What's going on here? And many of those things we can adjust as we go. But if you don't look at them until six months from now, there's a whole lot of unraveling to do versus if you caught that in the first week or first month. And then um, your business doesn't stay the same. Your business changes from month to month, from year to year. You add product lines, you change your processes. In the same way, your software should not stay the same. So if you implement software and you don't make any changes for three years, you're setting yourself up to be having to make these same decisions in just a couple of years because your software has to continue to grow with you. Um, times change. You want to be looking, you want to start having better reporting. Uh, you need to be, you need more data to make better decisions. Uh, maybe the metrics that you want to look at change. Are you, are you getting that information out of your system? And so, um, you know, when you talk to your vendor, find out when you have questions, who do I call? What's the support look like? Uh, maybe you want to add, you know, maybe phase two is a separate project, but sometimes you have questions outside of phase two of, well, you know, I'm sure there's a report. I, I know this data's in here, but how do I access it? Maybe you just need a, a simple support phone call um, to get that. But, but don't plan to implement and not make any changes to your software. You're, you're really setting yourself up for another, uh, lots of cost that could be avoided um, versus if you have a software that you continue to tweak, you continue to look at, you, um, it, it, should, it should last a long time. Um, unless there's something totally unforeseen that happens. So, uh, so I've done enough rambling. Are there any questions? Do you have a quick question? Yeah. Generally, before the go live date, is there 
are, are both softwares generally run parallel, or is there like a hard cut date where everything is is uploaded and you start? So when I was speaking of go live, I would have said that is when you have a clean company and you start in the new system. There are, I don't recommend running two systems parallel because you need to, you need to cut the cord, yeah. right? Otherwise, it's too easy to say, well, the old system still works. You're also asking your team to do double work for a longer time. Um, now, there are also cases where you try to go live and, you know, and so one thing I didn't talk about is right before go live, usually a, couple, a week before, maybe a couple days, the team needs to get together and say, are we ready? Have we tested? Can we run transactions? Do our users know how to use it? And there is a risk in that decision. And sometimes you talk about that and say, okay, there's, there's this area that we're not sure about. And, and then it really depends on the risk of the organization, the risk tolerance of are they, how confident are they? Um, and also how critical is that to the organization? But, but a lot of times you will see a, an actual just, let's stop using the old, let's transfer to the new. Yeah, that's a very good question. <clears throat> years ago, people used to go in parallel quite a bit. And I'm, I'm gonna go back 20, 30 years, I'm dating myself. But <clears throat> so in, those, in that time frame, people did a lot of parallel processing before cutting the cord. But today, as, as, as Cheryl was describing, the testing element, that kind of replaces that parallel. So in essence, you're, by doing all that testing and proving it all out, you're in essence kind of running parallel, so to speak and you get confident enough that you can actually throw the switch at a specific date. <clears throat> Anybody else? Go. Sean, Dave, what would you say is the biggest challenge or things you see going wrong when people, when companies try to implement hmm. um, First of all, executive leadership. If the executive group isn't bought in and communicating the need for the change, change management like we just talked about before, things can unravel very quickly. Also, if, if the employees don't see management involved in the project, even just stopping in and listening into the testing sessions, walking the deck, getting in there with your, your employees, people just, you know, they're not gonna grasp onto it as much, particularly if it's a lot of pain to change. If people aren't convinced that this is worth going through the pain, you're gonna get people jumping ship quick. So maybe at a high level, Kyle, that's, that's maybe the first is executive leadership. And actually I have a whole list of these topics that maybe we could do it for a different session. <laughs> of the, the lessons learned. I would say um, not knowing, you know, we talked about defining your goals or having a transcript. Um, we've worked with a client that um, selected a software because they needed one thing that QuickBooks wasn't providing for them. So they moved software. But what they didn't look at is, what is QuickBooks doing well for them? And they didn't double check the new software to make sure it could actually complete that. We got a phone call three months after they went live and said, how do we undo this? So make sure you know what you need. And we can help then, but we'd rather help up front. Yes. Okay. So. Hey, Cheryl and Dave, real quick. How long do you see that window from selection to go live typically? Great. Normal? Yeah, if, if you recall the slide I had of the different types of selections. Um, so if someone wants to take a lot of time, you just, just take their plain old time, it could take, in some cases, three, four to six months if they want to just take a real slow path. It could be as fast as a half hour phone call um, on the other side. Um, you know, if someone doesn't want to spend that kind of time, would like to rely on a consultant such as myself to help them get there quick for some business reason. But if there's a good business reason to take a little bit of time, typically can, can last two months, two to three months. And so, then, then implementation. Yeah, start. and I think so. Dustin was also asking about once you have it selected, right. what's the implementation calendar look like? And, and that varies greatly. We like to chop things up into manageable bites. I like to first of all target knocking out the incumbent system first as a first step and then moving on to more advanced functionality. And, and that'll just depend. It could be something that's a three month venture to get that, let's just say the GL, AP, AR, and maybe sales orders and purchase orders up. 
something like that. Um, in, in a larger company, that might be a six to eight month window. Um, and then you go on from there. There's, there's certainly add-ons and additional functionality that you can deploy as phase twos, phase threes. So I like to take it in chunks instead of a, a massive big bang, as we call it. So The other thing that I would say is there's, the, there's a happy medium. Mm -hmm. You know, depending on the or, your size of organization, you can, do too, you can go too fast, which means that you haven't had time for testing. You can also go too long because you get into analysis paralysis, you've maybe bitten off more than you should, and you start to forget the decisions that you made six to eight months ago. And, and you, at some point, you just start racking up costs that, yeah. that don't benefit you. And the bottom line is people need to be adequately trained at the end. I, I see so often people get fatigued with, with spend of the project, and they shortchange training at the end. And, and that's a disaster. That's an absolute disaster. So, and again, we, we could have a whole nother session on all the do's, don'ts, lessons learned, and we'd love to. So let us know. <laughs> Questions? Anything else around the room? Uh, Ernie? Is uh, the biggest challenge on entering of the data into a database to draw from your inventory, um, is there something easier other than having to enter 4,000 units with 50 parts each unit with 10 species and unlimited sizing? <laughs> yeah, I think, Cheryl, you mentioned Excel as, as, a, as a window in. That, that's just one mechanism. Um, so. I think what you're describing is very manual effort to do a lot of detail records. Well, and, and to create a database that you can draw from keeping track of your inventory, your costs, and or even to create a purchase order. So it's like unlimited, never ending. Unless there's, I was thinking here, you know, uh, Bill.com was talking about AI scan. Could we, like our drafting system, creates a purchase order or a parts list? If you could scan that automatically and, and, and dump it into a database rather than having to mental, manually enter every part, every component, every time changes a species or a size. So are you talking about the first, like that initial data load? Yeah. Okay, so a couple of things. Yes, we absolutely could look at, there's some software that write, you know, that will read a PDF document and try to take that into a data format. But you also mentioned you've already got a system that's generating this PO. Maybe that's not you know, maybe it's pulling IT in, and, and I've just, we just did this recently um, to try to, you know, maybe I couldn't pull the report that I thought I should be able to out of the old, the purchasing system or the, the CAD system, but if you have some kind of software that has inventory that you're looking at, maybe it's a SQL database or, you know, but there are, I would spend some time, if that's your scenario, to ask around and say, what kind of database is my CAD sitting on, and how do I extract that data? Because if you can extract it, you're absolutely faster to extract it than to key, re key in that data. Because that way we could go real time as orders pour in, rather than mm -hmm. trying to create a database so that you can draw from it, which you might use once a month, once a year, or 10 times a day. Correct. Yeah, and, and, some of, and, and maybe you need to look at, um, Bridging those two systems, you know, can you can you build connections out of your ERP into your drawing, uh, so that you're not having to do that data dump, so it's automatic. You yeah, know. depending on the CAD, like yeah. like you mentioned, Cheryl, whether it's auto, what version of, of AutoCAD, perhaps, or or some other yep. CAD tool that that do offer modules and adapters to do that kind of very thing. If you do, you have to understand the whole yeah. circumstance, of course. You know, something that might be similar, but uh, we've done. And actually, Microsoft has some of this stuff built in. But if your clients are placing orders online through a web portal, you know you can bridge that gap automatically so that the web, the your website, will push into your ERP system, and you don't have to rekey that sales order. And that can be a really big sa time saving. Yeah. You don't have to. Rekey all we got a couple accounts. In fact, we're working on right now bridging the e-commerce gap into ERP systems which is really effective and really a cost saver. So. Other things? All right, Good. thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
I see a lot of uh, familiar faces in the room. Uh, Swiss Woodcraft, uh, Pete Dunn, uh, Mr. Atley, and your crew, uh, you gentlemen. Uh, the last presen uh, presentations were pretty good. You know, software is really important. It made me think of a lot of things even before I get started here. You know, I've had customers tell me, Hod, we invested all this money in software, and if it was a car, I might get it out of the driveway and in the gear, but I can't go to the store to buy a quart of milk. And that's scary because software is really, really expensive. Um, I've had customers come to me, you know, and want a particular piece of machinery. That's what we do. We sell machinery. And they know they need it. The only way I'm going to stay competitive in the marketplace is I have that machinery. We start asking questions about their business. They have no software, no ERP or anything in place. And so I've built some good partnerships by saying, pump the brakes. I'd love to sell you a piece of equipment today because that's how I feed my family. But you're not ready for it. You're really not. And we've talked those customers into investing in some of those type of softwares, and they're a better company in the long run. They really are. Now on the flip side of that, <clears throat> we're gonna talk, I was asked to talk about automation today. You know, and I have customers, you know, that are looking at spending millions of dollars in these big factories. And the surprising thing is, sometimes there's a half million dollars worth of software because all these factories are driven on data. I mean. I sell a particular piece of equipment, an edge bander, that's scanning barcodes on product, and no one, no human is touching that product. Well, you can only imagine the data that has to be on that scanner to tell that piece of equipment where it's gotta be, what's gotta be done to it, where it's gotta go in the factory. So there is a lot of, you know, you guys talked about ERPs, there's MESs. Uh, I have a lot of customers now you know, three, four years ago, it really wasn't a conversation, but now it is, hey, I want my customers to go online on some type of configurator. I want them to pull out what products they want from me. I want them to hit the buy button. That stuff goes through my ERP, goes through an MES, goes through some type of optimization software, goes right out to my machines. And as soon as it's manufactured, it's invoiced, it's out the door. I mean, those, that's out there and it's reality. Uh, I have a lot of customers that are building towards that. <clears throat> so yes, I was uh, asked to come in and talk about uh, the automation and furniture and woodworking industry. Oops. Uh, my, uh, I'm the speaker. This is what happens when you let other people do your presentation for you. <laughs> this is a picture from LinkedIn probably 15 years ago, so it's, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, I do uh, work for the Edward B. Mahler company. I do represent Styles Machinery. Yeah, how many people in the room know who Styles Machinery is? Yeah, so Styles Machinery is uh, headquartered in Grand Rapids, Michigan. They're the largest importer in North America uh, in that industry selling equipment. To give you a little bit of uh, 2019, they did a little over $330 million in North America. That's, they're a publicly traded company, so that information's out there. Their next biggest competitor did a little over 110. So you can imagine, they're three times bigger than the next competitor. If it was a pie, they would have most of the pie. But to be fair to everybody else, they do everything, almost from the tree, to finishing, to manufacturing, to solid wood, to panel processing, you know, right down the line, they're involved in the whole uh, product breadth of the industry. So that's why their number's so big. Uh, my opening statement, I help business partners that are frustrated in our current business environment with limited employees, overwhelmed with too much potential business, with no capacity to manufacture while maintaining favorable margins. Have this conversation every day. Every time I'm in front of a business owner, <clears throat> hot, I got more work than I could jump over. I can't throw employees at it like I used to. In America, we were really good at just, you got a problem, we'll throw some more people at it. Fortunately today, we just can't do that. There's a lot of work out there that pays a lot of good money and everybody wants a piece of that pie. So my phone rings every day. I just had a conversation at seven o'clock this morning. Hod, we gotta change our business. There's too much work out there. We gotta get our piece of the pie. How can you help us? And so those are daily conversations. I'm gonna show you some different levels of automation along with different ways of justifying capital investments and in automation. 
preparing for this this week, I, I, I'm in front of business owners every day, and I kind of start asking, what, how do you define automation? How, how do you guys define it? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Doing more with less. Doing more with less. Anybody else? I heard a lot this week, oh, it's really expensive, it's huge. You know, you gotta buy, build a brand new plant. I mean, that's true. There are some people out there that are groundbreaking, building new plants, starting from a clean piece of paper, wanting to manufacture. Um, I got a customer I can share with you. We'll just say uh, they build cabinets. They build 50 cabinets a day. And in those cabinets, most people in the room know, there's 11, 10 to 11 pieces, depending on how you manufacture a cabinet. So that's a lot of pieces a day he has to manufacture. He wants to go from 50 to 150 with the capability of building 200. So you kind of work backwards. How many pieces do I need to make? What kind of equipment do I need to purchase? Those are things that we're doing every day. I think automation could be anything. Uh, Swiss Woodcraft, I think you guys own some Tiger Stops? Bought 15 years ago, I believe. I mean, that's a product you could put on a simple table saw or a, or a chop saw, and to me, that's automation, right? The simplest form, you're, you're making that uh, operation, you're taking uh, the, the operator and what he's thinking, taking that all out and letting the machine do the work. I think that's automation, all the way up to spending millions and millions of dollars on equipment. Uh, I, <clears throat> being asked to talk about automation, I do represent Styles Machinery, so this is gonna sound like a little bit of a commercial here for Styles, but I, I'll get to the point is, when you really look at automation and you wanna change your shop, you really should partner with somebody. And, and that partnership's really important. So I'm gonna sell Styles here just a little bit on who they are. Can we play the video? <clears throat> we'll try to play a video. So interesting concept here. These are people wearing AI goggles, husband and wife picking out a new kitchen cabinet. They can literally pick hardware out, different styles of doors, different countertops, and see it before it's even manufactured and what it looks like in their home. Very software, I mean, th those are just showing software. That data is being puked out onto the production floor and driving machines. I mean, these, these are driving around product from one operation to the next. Th this is live, I mean, this is happening around you right now. I have customers that are doing this. Styles is owned by Home Ag, which is a German company. They love these graphical commercials with great music.
So my goal there is not to scare you that Home Mag or Styles is all they only deal with the most advanced companies and have the most technology. They do do that. When I talk about a partner, partnering with someone that has, has that capability that has done it all over the world, they build their business on the traditional uh, customer. You know, the customer that's buying just a simple machine. That is who they are. That's who they do really well with. But when we talk about automation, I, I just want to show you some of the things that are capable. Uh, Styles is a, a world, or Home Mag is a worldwide company, 6,500 employees worldwide, um, you know, 1.2 billion worldwide. They have uh, 14 production sites. Uh, here in North America, uh, right here is Michigan, Grand Rapids, Michigan. They're building a CNC router, uh, the flat table router that a lot of you are familiar with. You know, four by eight, five by 10, five by 12, very simple commodity piece of equipment that when we manufactured it in Germany, it was about $50,000 more than it is being built here. Because now we can source all that stuff into America and we cut out all the tariffs and the taxes and the, and the ship, especially now, the shipping is what used to be a $5,000 container from Germany, now it's 15,000. I mean, the shipping costs have just went crazy. We're in a great position because we are sourcing a lot of stuff in, in the States and we're building it in America. So it's been a great program. And they're building about 300 routers a year Sold one yesterday, it's eight month lead time. Can't build them fast enough. It's incredible. Um, 60 uh, sales partners like myself, and my company uh, worldwide. So what does Styles do really well? I think Styles in the industry is a leader for one reason, is because they, after the sale. Styles really believes in, after you buy a piece of equipment or invest in automation, Everybody knows that equipment breaks and that you're gonna have questions or technical help. They do a great job at phone support. Last year, uh, you know, 55,000, um, he's changed the names on me. 55,000 customer support. Shipping, yeah, he's totally changed the names on me. So phone support would be technical support here. Um, these guys do, when you when you become a Styles uh, customer, before you even, they even pick up the phone, they know who you are. Now that's caller ID, that's pretty easy. But they also know on the screen who you are, what machines you own, and they know every time you've ever called in. So there's some history there that they can refer to. What's nice about that is, is if you have a continuing problem, we can keep looking at those things and, and, and fix it. Or if you set me down at one time and say, hey, this automation or this equipment we're just really struggling with it. I can go back and refer to all those times. Every time you've called in there and had a problem, we can sit down and talk about it. Um, they are very good at, I think 80% of the time, the very first phone call, they received 55,000 phone calls last year. They could fix the problem over the phone. They have a lot of pride of that. Things like uh, they have $65 million in parts. They have a picture of every part. So if you call in and say, hey, this yellow thing in the corner is smoking, I don't know what it is, but it's on fire, I need a new one. You know, they have a picture of, uh, they take about 50 pictures of your piece of equipment before when they install it. So you, we can pull up actual pictures of your piece of equipment and say, is this what you're talking about? Yep, this is what a new one looks like, is that it? Yep, doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're down, you know how important it is to get back up and running. And having $65 million in parts it's a lot of money in parts. We talked about sa annual sales. My next biggest competitor is 110 million. They have 65 million in parts. And, and this part system is, is, if you've never toured styles in the last 10 years, this is worth going to see. We have aerospace customers of mine that go there and spend a week just taking in how it works. And it's, it's analyzing every day how many parts they sell, what they sell, into what model they sell. So if you were to buy a piece of equipment from me, I can literally print off the most common pieces or parts that have ever been sold to that model. And you can look at it and go, okay, those are in stock. Why is this one in stock? Maybe I'll buy that one, keep it on the shelf, because I, I value not being down. Because most of the equipment that you guys buy will become the heartbeat of your business. Uh, shipping, full-time, you know, all this is 24-7. Uh, I had a customer the other day here from uh, Mansfield, Ohio, called me the next day at three in the morning, they broke down. They called Styles. they got literally a guy out of bed because they have 24 seven, they don't have people sitting at a computer, somebody's on call. 
The guy was in North Carolina on call, answered the phone, told my customer, I'm literally sitting on the edge of my bed with my wife and my dog. He walked them through the problem, got them back up and going within an hour. That's dedication to keep people up and going. Education, uh, I think is worth speaking about. Styles does a great job. They're the only uh, competitor that has a university, which pretty means they, they've been ISO 2000 certified. They have a curriculum. They teach things like how to maintenance uh, your piece of equipment or European wiring, uh, if you could send your maintenance staff, just how to run. Say you own a CNC and you, and you lost an employee, you lost some tribal knowledge, you need to get somebody up there to relearn how to run the piece of equipment you have. They have classes for that. So now with COVID, they do have most of the classes are online now. And that's become really popular because it is a big investment. You'll learn more when you're in the classroom setting up there because there's no distractions and you're around other people just like you. But with COVID and, and with everyone just so busy, it's nice to be able to have you know 60 days to go through a course, refresh yourself, and so those are available. There's another video. Andrew. <laughs> He's on Facebook, <laughs> checking out styles. Videos are nice to kind of break up the presentation, keep you guys alive. Anybody got any questions up till now? That face that is usually covered. I think that's a commercial. There's the parts, you know. Supply world class manufacturing solutions. And we couldn't do this without the world class team. Our people are the heart and soul of all ideas, every product, every problem we solve. From the Northeast Service Manager for Style Machinery, he's so representative of the Servicio Tecnico, and it's nice. I'm the Operations Administrator of Styles Engineer Solutions. I'm an FSR and a district team leader for the Great Lakes region. I love my job. So it's more than 450 employees, a lot of things going on every day. Starting with uh, designing machines, building machines down the road, helping customers with 50,000 spare parts shipments every year. Of course, we have salesmen, product specialists, product engineers on the road, troubleshooting machines, fixing problems, and bringing the machines back to operation for our customers. The industries we touch are cabinets, furniture, fixtures, some aerospace, some aluminum. The difference between styles and our competition is we're not interested in just putting a machine in your shop. We want to grow with you. We want to sell you the right solution at the right time. I mean, it's really this team approach to figure out what fits the best for them to make them successful. We see what our customers' challenges are. We know what the needs are. We know what needs to be built. We know what's available and what needs to be developed. And we have the strongest team within the home act group to help us execute what our customers need. As good as we are in building machines, designing machines, at the end of the day, our customers are experts of using our machines. Customers buy this equipment because they want something that's going to withstand 10, 20 years of harsh conditions. We are listening to our customers, asking questions, and open to change to have a more valuable solution for our customers. When the customer trusts on you, it's not only trust on you, trust in your company, trust in your brand, trust in everything. We're not, not looking at one, three, five, and ten years down the road. We have things in development that the market doesn't even know they need yet. We're working to be innovative in our business processes, in our proposals, in our tech support, looking at all ways to better serve our customers. With Styles, you buy the people, you buy the parts, you buy the service, you buy everything that's incorporated with it, so you're not just buying the equipment, you're also buying us as well. I get out of bed every day with the thought that there's going to be something new when I walk through the door, and there is. There's always a new challenge, a new concept, or a new idea. At Styles, we flip the pyramid. It's not my job to dictate everyone what to do, how to behave. We flip it around and have our employees 
driving the organization towards a common vision we all share. You can accomplish so much more when you don't feel that stress of, I think this is a good idea, but I'm really not sure, so I'm just not going to speak up. And if we don't have to keep people in bottles and boxes like that, there's no stopping what we can do here. I can tell you about so many customers that I have met across the country that uh, have got success stories because they chose to partner with us. And that's exciting to see. So again, I... You ever wonder what actor... <laughs> you ever wonder? <laughs> Thank God that could have been anything that came up next. <laughs> we could have been in trouble. <laughs> again, I, it's, you know, a few minutes there to spend who Styles is. They are somebody who, if you're looking for a partner in this woodworking industry or plastics or non-ferrous metal, they do have tons of resources. You know, they're the biggest in the, in the industry for a reason. They do a great job. So one of the things is uh, they do really well. At one time, Home Ag in Germany uh, had an initiative called Cleaning the House. And this is kind of back to a little bit of the parts, but Cleaning the House meant why do we own 10 different factories? One factory builds a CNC, this one's building edge banners, this one's building white belt sanders, and they all do their own thing. They were literally their own companies under one umbrella of Home Ag. Home Ag, and it's taken a good 10 years, if not longer, to say, we're all using pulleys, we're using belts, we're using bearings, we're using monitors and interfaces. Why do we not try to make all that stuff common? And even though they have $65 million in parts up there, you would be surprised how many, this bearing now works on an edge banner, works on a CNC, works on other things. The, the big one here is the monitor. This is called the power touch monitor. You'll see them on our equipment. It looks like a big iPad. What's great about that is every employee in your business walks up to the same interface. No matter if he's walking up to a, whatever piece of equipment in his factory, he's comfortable with it. He knows how to navigate it. Those things have so much memory and they, they have your manuals on there. They have videos on there, how to do preventative maintenance. When you have a problem, Styles is very good at, they can remote in on an ethernet cable and I've had tons of customers get their machines fixed overnight. Sometimes we have Germany dial in and you come in in the morning and your machine's configured differently, the software, and it's fixed. So they've done a real nice job of making things common. What the benefit to our customers is now we have parts available. Um, if you were ever to visit up there, they would tell you, I told you earlier, they fixed the, the same thing or the first phone call when a customer calls in with a problem is 80%. By the third call, it's up to like 92. Meaning, hey, put a multimeter here. Hey, try this, call me back. By the third call, 90 some percent of the problems are fixed over the phone. They have over 100 field, 150 field service representatives carrying toolboxes working on that 6%. That's pretty impressive if you think of that. So they do a real nice job. So automation, the real reason I'm here, I'm selling styles to tell you how the, who they are and how, what they do. So automation, um, some things in, the, in our industry that I see a lot of, I was privileged many years ago, Styles would send me over to Germany or Taiwan to see how other manufacturing companies did things. And I seen a lot of this type of stuff because they don't have a lot of land over there. The buildings are very expensive and they have to take little, little pieces of property and, and produce a lot. So this, a lot of this stuff has been driven overseas and come to America. But these are storage retrieval systems. Uh, all my customers, when you go in, you'll see uh, big metal racks stacked everywhere with lift truck aisles, and they got all their inventory stacked on uh, pallets. Anybody have that in their, in their shop? Seen that? Yeah. So what a storage retrieval system does is you dump all your raw materials into one system. This system knows when you bought it, what you paid for it, where it's at. It doesn't care if it's stacked a three quarter inch board on top of a quarter inch board, on top of a one inch board, on top of a yellow board, a white board. It knows exactly where every piece of equipment or your raw materials at. In any given time from your computer, you can hit one button. You know how much money you have in inventory. You know what you're low on. You know what you need to order. Talk about ERP systems a little earlier. That could even work with your ERP and you can set mins and maxes and have materials ordered automatically. So it's a very powerful tool. Saves about 30% of floor space. 
I've had customers come to me and say, hey, Hod, we're gonna add on, we need to produce twice as much. You know, we're gonna spend $2 million on a new building, our taxes are gonna go up, our insurance is gonna go up. Hold on, pump the brakes. Let's look at maybe just changing how you do things now under the same roof, and we can produce twice as much because we saved a lot of production floor space. So we can add other equipment. Uh, robots, big topic. If we have Atlanta this year, I think you're gonna see a lot. Atlanta is our uh, show we have every two years in our industry. It's the big show everyone goes to to see what's new. You're gonna see a lot of robots. My opinion is I have discussions a lot about robots. In the, in the right situations, they're doing really well. I don't know if we're there yet, but we're working on it. It's coming. Um, you know, labor shortage, trying to get employees. It's funny, some of the stories I hear, you know, I talked to 16 people yesterday. I told them all to show up. Not one of them showed up. I mean, it's amazing to me how employers are trying to find employees every day and they just can't. They're just not showing up to work. Uh, and even getting uh, skilled labor. So a lot of our equipment and some of the videos, you probably didn't recognize it, but business owners are coming to Styles and myself and saying, you need to, hate to use the term, dumb these machines down. I, I need to be able to pull a guy off the street that has no clue of what he's doing and make him and have him run this machine safely, but intuitive, you know, LED lights, put the part here, you know, follow the green light. Uh, we even have some cameras over top machines when you have multiple parts and it's telling the operator what part to machine first or the second one. And if he mixes them up, the software changes it and it knows he, the operator made a mistake, but the machine doesn't. So those things are out there. Um, you know, it's all about just all products can be produced, can be sold, more output. This is uh, another example of a robot. We're, the, this one has called on a lot. So this is called a panel saw. At the end of the day, everyone knows what a table saw is. A panel saw takes big squares, makes a lot of little squares, and you can pack and you can stack uh, sheets four by eight, five by 10, like big sheets of plywood, multiple sheets, cuts it into little squares. It's a lot of work for someone to do it. They've added robots to do it now. It sits on top of it, you can label the product, the robot's moving the panel all around, feeding, you can go to, do, this is a great, this is really caught on in North America. We're seeing a lot of this, uh, especially coupled with a storage and retrieval where the storage retrieval is storing all your raw materials. It's feeding the saw in the back and all the operator's doing is catching product. We're feeding CNC machines, feeds into a CNC, the machine cuts all the parts out, offloads it, gets the next piece in, it's starting to cut while the operator's unloading the parts. So it's very efficient. These things, are, these things are very relevant in our industry now. You know, here's a vertical drilling machine for an example. We, we've put robots in front of them. So it's loading raw material into this, it's getting machined, the robot's grabbing it. It could either come through all the way or come out the, the way it went in and he's stacking finished products there. So automation, robots, it's coming. It's, it's very, it's everyday conversation. <clears throat> we talked a little bit earlier about these little guys I have customers, I think they're called uh, automated ground vehicles, but they're literally taking stacks of material and moving them across the production floor instead of lift trucks. I mean, they're pretty cool. They're pretty fun to watch. Uh, they got little headlights on them. People put stickers on them, and, but they're doing a task and it's really neat. Uh, TFL is the uh, storage retrieval. A big part of our industry is, and it's you talk about software driven, is that you know, maybe we can store the raw material and we can feed machines and now we have all these parts and what do we do with these parts? If they're not, even if they're labeled, I have operators that are, all these parts are coming at them, how do I manage that? So sorting has become a really big thing and you can do it with robots, you can do it with humans. What this robot is doing is taking parts and they're putting them in the bins. So it knows here's bin three and bin 17, it's sticking parts in there and there's guys on the other side that are assembling knows a light goes off. So 17 has all the parts in it, it needs to complete that box, product, whatever it is, piece of furniture. So he goes to 17, pulls all those parts out, assembles it. And as he's assembling, the robot's filling the other things, the other lights come on, hey, slot five is ready now. 
grab all the parts out of five and assemble it. So I've seen production lines that are building a commercial cabinet. Every three minutes, they're popping out a cabinet. I mean, that's insane. That's just a lot from raw material all the way out. There's hardly three or four people running that whole work cell, and they're pumping a cabinet out every three minutes. It all has to do with automation and software. So a roadmap towards more automation. The colleague that couldn't make it today, uh, I'm filling in for, works for a company that's owned by HOMAG called Schuler Consulting. So I've found in North America, and when I talk to most people, the word consulting makes everyone just, eh, that's expensive, scared to death of it. Three years ago, five years ago, I couldn't hardly get a customer to even have a conversation with me about consulting, and especially when I talked about Schuler. So what Schuler is, is a company that worldwide comes to our industry. It's all they do. They don't do any other industries. They know your industry inside and out. And if you were to hire them and, and enter into a partnership with them, they could take everything from the way you take an order. We talked about earlier about having configurators and running them through MES systems and MERP systems or ERP systems through an optimization program. They can lay that whole roadmap out. And I've got companies in town that are doing a really good job with it. Um, I have one company that built boxes. I was telling you earlier, um, I think at the end of the day, currently they had 32 people building 50 boxes a day. We drove it down. They had about nine bucks per part. So Schuler uh, looked at how they were doing things, come up with about five different plans. It could have been a $3 million investment, $4 million investment, $5 million investment. Here's your ROI. Here's how many less people that you'll use in your manufacturing floor. The one they're choosing, they'll have about eight people building three times as much product, and each part is about a little less than $3. So you can imagine their margin went way up. A lot of software. There's a half million dollars worth of software there to run that kind of a program, but it's out there. Machines today. Um, this is the same machine, believe it or not. These two here are a really popular configuration. Um, you know, I have a lot of customers that still have the mentality to and I'm the same way, hey, this works, I'm just gonna buy another one, right? I, I, I need more. If your planer was full and you needed another planer, you'd buy another planer right next to it. So what we're trying to do is get customers to start thinking about when you buy those machines, there are other configurations that in the future, maybe this could be a continuous line, it's the same machine, but now you've bought it to be ready to do a continuous line or, or maybe you wanna put a robot in here so just thought process, um, I'm starting to have a lot of conversations. Again, three, five years ago, customers didn't want to have that conversation. Now they want to have it. You know, let's talk about, I'm going to buy this machine, but I want to configure it because in five years if my business keeps growing, I want to be able to automate that process. So not suitable, suitable, partially suitable. One more video. This is more about Schuler Consulting. So if anybody thinks that Schuler might be something that you could use in your business, I have plenty of references in your neighborhood or using it now. Stay Just get with this. Just as limitless as the new possibilities are, viewed by the digitization of your production, you also face technical hurdles and intransparent processes. Mm -hmm. New production technology requires an increasing amount of qualified production data, which leads to rising compatibility issues of different systems. Therefore, your employees lose track of processes and are sometimes forced to a high amount of manual labor. We at Schuler help you to simplify the expansion of your integrated production line. With the help of our technical experience, we are taking the journey into the digital future together. We define goals and communicate clear recommendations to determine with our clients a tangible plan of action. We identify and eliminate any disturbing sources so that digitization will not make your production more complex, but much smarter. You decide from the very beginning how extensive this process is set up to be, ranging from workshops that identify your biggest IT problems over optimizing the current systems 
Invader interfaces, down to a complete modernization of your company's IT landscape. Our technical experience in the furniture industry and the goal-oriented consultation turns your digital future into reality. So again, big picture, uh, you know, that's a shop that not everyone's going to build. Schuler can come in. I've seen them come in to a customer of mine that was a five-man shop. They built uh, home uh, residential cabinets. They used, they still were doing paper drawings. They had no CAD CAM software. Hired Schuler to come in. Uh, Schuler consulted them to enter into some CAD CAM software. They still were using a, a, I hate to use in, industry terms, but like an Altendorf saw, a sliding table saw. But now we were able to print labels at the sliding saw, enter it to a pod and rail machine. That, just the software alone and what Schuler helped them was a huge cost savings to them. The ROI is less than a year. You know, the small company that was scared of investing, they probably invested less than $10,000 in this basic CAD CAM software, a, a printer for three grand. It, it was revolutionary to their business. So it doesn't have to be large manufacturing. They're really good at that, but they're really good at the small customer too. So if you have a process that you think there's got to be a better way that we can do this with less people and be more profitable, that's what they do really well at. And some of the things that they'll do, uh, you know, I had a, this is their kind of their path, right? Their roadway. I had a customer just to try to define this, you know, um, wanted to start a new segment in his business. He wanted it to do $10 million in sales. So that was the strategic goal. Here's my product. I want to sell $10 million worth of it. How do I produce it? And how do I make this margin on it? And they literally could walk through, evaluate, you know, what kind of quantities, how are you gonna batch that and sort it? You know, definition of process, definition of quantities, which means we talked about it a little bit earlier, uh, say it's a piece of furniture and it's got six pieces in it. Okay, let's dissect each piece. Let's figure out what needs to be done to it. How do we, how do we create that roadmap? Uh, capital investments, uh, the ideal layouts, uh, MR, ROIs, there's something else in this industry that's pretty interesting it, through all this COVID in the last couple of years, all my customers used to base all their purchases pretty much on an ROI. Like that was the industry standard. And it's still, if I'm trying to sell you a robot and it's 600,000 and it replaces four people and you say each person's worth $50,000, okay, that's a three year return on my money, right? So I, I save 200,000 a year, 600,000, it's three years. I hear a lot of customers now not necessarily basing on purchases on ROIs, but on opportunities. If I could buy that robot for 600,000 and it produces 100 extra parts a day, that's 500 parts a week, 2,000 a month, it's 12,000 you know, uh, a year, or 24,000 a year, that's another 1.2 million to my, to my business. And oh, by the way, I didn't get rid of those four people, I moved them over to a different segment of my business, and now they were able to produce more product. So I'm hearing a lot more conversation about opportunity cost versus ROI. Both very important. I think that's the end of my slideshow. So appreciate everyone's time. If you got any questions, uh, I'd be more than glad to talk to anyone at lunch. I want to get started here shortly so you guys can get back to your places of business this afternoon and start solving, solving some of the problems that uh, you maybe thought about today as we were going through this. But, uh, my name is Kyle Stemple. I'm the East Central Regional President for Rain Associates. So I oversee the New Philadelphia, Millersburg, and Worcester offices. Uh, I've been with the firm for 20 years, and uh, fortunately, I sat in uh, Dustin's shoes as Director of Manufacturing. And you know, you just keep hiring people that are smarter than you. So I got Dustin. Now we got Andrew, and it just keeps replacing us. So uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. I see a lot of familiar faces. Thank our panelists uh, for being here and asking, uh, being basically allowing to share with you some of the things they've done in their experience as well too. I think as we were designing this uh, <clears throat> presentation today, I think that uh, it would be surprising and I think we would be living under rocks if we didn't realize the labor shortage and the importance of automation not to, not to be successful, 
But in order to take what all of you've created within your businesses and continue to be successful, due to the labor shortage, I really believe we're gonna have to automate. And we're gonna have to look at different ways to do things. Um, so obviously a lot of today was about labor, a lot of it today was about automation, and hopefully you can take some of these things back to your org organization and start having some brainstorming, thinking how could we potentially do something like this. So I'm gonna allow our panelists to introduce themselves, where they're from, names, as well as kind of a little bit about what their experience has been with automation. And as after we get through that, if there's questions from the group and you have something specific you wanna know, we'll go there. If not, I've got uh, 325 questions uh, here. So, uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. And uh, <clears throat> we'll start with Joe. Uh, my name is Joe Work. Uh, I'm with Magnet uh, and uh, Magnet's a company that um, it's mission driven. It uh, basically is in, um, it's around to help manufacturers. We only work with manufacturers and help them grow their business. Uh, we have a number of different areas that we get involved in. One of them is custom equipment design and build for companies. Um, others are with regard to sales and marketing help strategies and operations improvement um, doing lean uh, engagements and things like that um, i'll point out janelle over there in the middle if you need any kind of information specific to magnet she can do a really good job probably better than i can as to explain what the heck we do um, i am involved mostly in automation uh, at magnet um, I'm an electrical engineer. I've been doing automation projects ever since I got out of college, which actually was a long time ago. And um, as far as experience with uh, working with, you know, the whole automation concept, when I first started out, I think automation was not, was more of a, a nasty word to a lot of people than it is today. Um, where it was just about cutting labor and, you know, getting higher margins and things like that. Um, today, I think automation is looked upon more favorably as just allowing companies to, to survive uh, in what they're doing, you know, basically because of the pressures from uh, either labor or uh, competition from around the world that the U.S. finds itself in. I'm Jeremy Likens. I'm with Eagle Machinery out of Sugar Creek, Ohio. Um, we primarily work with um, what we call the secondary market in lumber manufacturing. So after the trees and the logs are processed and it becomes lumber, that's when we usually get involved for our clients. They make anything from furniture, stair parts, anything made of wood that you can see. You can look around and see moldings. You can see wood everywhere you go. Um, we often have a part in the handling of that. People have bunks of lumber, packs of lumber, stacks of lumber, break it apart. We try to maximize the yield out of that to get the most value. The automation aspect is everything that we do is automation. Automation is just, you know, to me an industry speak term that it's really nothing new. Automation has been happening for probably a hundred years. People have been trying to find a better way. Um, but the main thing about automation is, in my opinion, like Joe had said is, you know, there's nothing nasty about it at all. It's, it's sort of like displacing a need in one spot and putting it in another area. So. When you think about automating something that might eliminate some some jobs, you know maybe it's enough to kick some people in the pants a little bit here to find something better. Uh, a quick example would be uh, we have people in, in, in a lot of ma uh, wood manufacturing that, that mark lumber with crayons, where something scans it and tells a saw to cut it. Where and, you know that that's very easily automated with artificial vision, camera systems, things like that. Um, but what we want to do is not just, it's not just about saving the labor and not having to hire more people that do the job, a, a very menial task job for a week and quit. You got to start all over again. It's not just about that. It's about, it is about that, but it's also about maybe reassigning who you have and putting them somewhere else. Uh, one quick example, uh, we had a system put in years ago in North Carolina. I've been with the company six years now and the VP explained a lot of information. I was pretty impressed with their outfit. And uh, he said, this, this system you guys helped install for us, you know, eliminated 17 people from this area. 
And I raised an eyebrow to that. I was like, oh, that sounds like there's good and bad. You know, I was thinking in my head as I'm new to this industry. And he goes, and, he goes, and we retained everyone that was in this area in better positions. I think every, every employee needs to be listened to, but also challenged. I think there's a balance there. You can't give them everything they want. And you got to challenge them, you know, and I think giving them a higher role, more empowerment, it's just you win so many ways from automation. And we might be putting something out of business, but that means something else is growing, and that's just the way it's always been. So, uh, My name is Mara Zais. I am formerly with Ray and Associates. Um, I was a part of, started in tax, and then was a part of the CAS team with Matt. Um, and uh, most recently left my position as controller for Kitty Poo Club, which is an e-commerce uh, subscription cat litter box. Um, what you wouldn't think of something that needs to be manufactured, but over the last year, I was involved in not only implementing a brand new ERP system, um, moving away from QuickBooks and SOS inventory um, into a cloud-based um, ERP system, but also spending about a million dollars on new lines and different automation and things like that so that we could increase our capacity. Um, so I'll echo what, what they said. When I think about automation, it's not necessarily um, replacing, but elevating. Mm -hmm. So by taking someone off the line, we were able to elevate people to different positions. We took someone who was working on the production line and they became a material planner and they became um, our purchasing person. So their knowledge of the line and their knowledge of the products, um, we were able to <coughs> make that stream more efficient so then we could take other people and, uh, and use them in different ways. So I'm, I guess I'm here with a real life example. So. I'll tell all the horror stories if you want to tell, if you want to hear them. So. Well, you're not alone. I have a few, too. Um, I'm Randy Kitzmiller, uh, general manager currently at uh, Ventrac, uh, division of Toro Company. And um, I have over 40 years, I hate saying that, <laughs> over 40 years of experience in manufacturing and various management positions. Um, we manufacture, uh, I don't know who knows what Ventrac is, we manufacture a very unique um, subcompact tractor and attachments and uh, we, our manufacturing is very different from most of yours. We, we deal with steel, so instead of screwing it and gluing it, we're welding it. Uh, but we, we do our own design work uh, from laser cutting sheet steel, bending it, forming it, welding it, powder paint system, assembly, um, and then distribution and aftermarket support. So pretty much the full line uh, there through manufacturing. We've experienced tremendous growth the last 15 years, averaging about 20, 25% of growth every year. Um, in 2010, we had 50 employees. Today, we're 315-ish and growing, looking to double in the next several years again. So the growth, you know, when I, when I think about automation, whew, it's a must. With our growth, we have, to, we have to do that. And I look at our history, we started with robotic welders back in the late and mid, mid 80s. Um, and that's developed to this year we've now purchased our first dual arm, first two, we went, had to buy two, um, <laughs> dual arm robotic welder to, to hit throughput that we have to have. So one welded running robot wasn't enough. We need two on that weldment. Um, we're, we have laser cutting machines, uh, just, just put a new one in about a month ago and it's twice as fast as the last one we put in. Um, they can all be run lights out, uh, and we're doing that. It's a game changer. Uh, the one that it, it's double fast as uh, is outworks the other three that we have on the floor. So it, the technology is just is mind blowing. We just purchased a first robotic press brake. Um, for an old guy, it just blows my mind. Uh, it used, you know, usually a guy has to stand there, 
press the pedal, bend it, turn it. Now this robotic arm picks the pieces up, puts it in, turns it around, turns it around, and then lays it on a conveyor. No human touches it. It's a game changer. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's incredible, but there's no way we could grow the fa as fast as we are without automation. Well, thank you guys for sharing your opinions there. That's, it's great. I think uh, I'm having flashbacks to when we used to talk about Lean Six Sigma and everybody being so afraid, we can't do that. We're going to lose employees or we're going to displace employees. And I feel like automation is that next thing. Oh, what's going to happen with our employees? But as I said years ago with, with Lean, we're not displacing employees. We're looking at different ways to use them. And that's assuming we can find them which I think is gonna be the biggest problem and which is why we have to do this even when we don't want to or may not want to. Uh, I'm gonna go off script a little bit here. Uh, <laughs> so Randy, now that I got you warmed up, talk to me about your first experience with automation and what that was and how it made you feel. I don't know that I can go back that far. <laughs> I mean, because, because I think, I think, I don't know which one of you said that, automation is, to me, is just continuous improvement. Um, you know, in, in business, to be successful, you have to have good product, good people, and good processes. I, that's what I believe. And a lot of what we talked about, you guys talked about this morning, is about processes. Well, except people. You did talk about people. Um, and, and automation is just part of that, making that process faster. Um, if you have a good process, don't, by the way, don't ever try to automate something that you have a bad process. Take a, take a good process and automate it. Um, but, uh, you know, more recent, uh, I see, what was the original question? <laughs> <laughs> now you're testing me. So I said, tell me about your, one of your first experiences with automation and how that made you feel. And was it a little uncomfortable at first? Well, uh, so this, this robotic press break is completely new to us. And that's probably the most recent thing. And it's like, boy, really, we're going to spend that much money on that? But boy, once you get it in, and it's only been there two months, it's making, it's making production parts. And it's like, ah. But my first thing is we should have done this years ago. Mm -hmm. That's that's usually the feeling you have. I don't know if you're like customers yet. Well, man, we should have done this years ago. And that's yeah. I I would just encourage anybody do it now. Get started because the things you learn today will help you. You just build on them. I don't know if I answered your question. No, that was good. That was good. That was a good test, good warm up. All right, Mara, do you remember the question? Because I don't. Uh, let's see, my first, uh, my first foray into automation. So I've been in manufacturing um, since I got out of high school and worked through high school in a, in a uh, biotech lab. I was a chemist um, until I finished in accounting, which I know is a really weird, really weird thing to do. but. Um, I have always been into technology. So from the time that, not, I'm not aging, but you know, from the time that I was young, typing on a computer, um, and then, you know, now I'm really gonna date internet and all of that stuff. Um, but um, for me, when I moved into my first kind of accountant role at a manufacturing firm, we had just put into place um, an inventory sorting system so it was this massive, uh, massive tower. I think they even showed one. Um, and we would put all of our inventory parts um, into that system. And you could touch a screen what you wanted or scan a barcode or something. And the system would sort it out for you and produce the part that you needed. And we worked with very, very small widgets and screws and just had thousands of parts. Um, and so that just amazed me. Um, and not only automation, but I'm going to group e ERP into that. And um, Cheryl and Dave did a really great job on that um, because that is only going to make your automation even more efficient. So combining the two, um, 
just really, you can see it make magic and you can see it uh, not only inspire people as well, but give you more opportunity to reach out to more people than you ever thought of before. So, um, so for me, being newer in the industry, almost six years now, um, I didn't get to see the before picture, I got to see the after picture. So for me, it was trying to understand what am I looking at? You know, I don't know that I see the magic just yet, you know, because as we've grown up and seen things on TV, we see crazy, unbelievable automation from Toyota and all these other different, you know, automobile industry, whatever you have in, in your mind picture what automation should be. So whatever I would see in some of these mills or in our own shop, like, What's so hard about this? It's going this way, it goes that way, it comes out. It's what I probably expected. And, uh, but I think for me was just really not getting the, the wow factor, the understanding of it until I heard it from the mouths of the customer, uh, especially the people in those stressful positions that are trying to make it work and trying to make you know, all the stakeholders win and be profitable so you can grow and sleep at night without worrying and stressing over all that stuff. Um, so I think, for me, just listening to the customers talk about how vital it is to their, you know, and, you know, the, 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 I forget his name, Hot, I think it was his name from Styles. The machinery becomes the lifeblood of, you know, you don't have that and it's not working very well. You know, you need the people, but you need that. It's like the chicken and egg, you need them both. But uh, I was just really shocked at how important this was to these people to, to meet their demands. And sometimes on a tech support call, we get reminded when, they tell us how much they're losing per hour if we don't get this fixed, right? So I, that, to me, was my first experiences with really understanding the impact, I think, of, of automation and the importance of keeping it running and um, just what it does for them to stay on track so they can smile. And, um, you know, Terry Baird is someone that one of our customers from uh, Baird Brothers Sawmill up in Canfield, Ohio. He did a little video for one of our partners, OSI Machinery. And I just, the whole video, he's just kind of talking about how he loves their planer. But by the end of it, he just says, when everything works, he goes, everything in life just goes so much easier. <laughs> so it's, you can just see the sigh of when it's running, boy, life is easy, you know. But yeah, the automation is just, uh, in a way, it can be a crutch. You know, you need it, but that you, it can't be a broken crutch. You have got to make sure that it's working the whole time. But uh, yeah, so I, I've learned a lot in six years, and, and I've realized that this stuff is, uh, the impact that it makes is, is unbelievable. See, it's like coming full circle. So we go in there and we explain to a customer what we're gonna save them, what the ROI is gonna be. And then when it's broke down, they remind us about the ROI not being there and what we're losing per minute. So yeah, that's, it's, good. it's a good point. Joe? So I, I, come, I started out in the era 40 years ago. Um, you know, my first job was uh, with programming PLCs, programmable logic controllers, um, right when they started coming out. So that kind of, it's, it's been a while back. Uh, but, you know, at that time it was taking relay logic that's hardwired and transforming it into software. And that was when that really started happening uh, and it started taking off. Um, but just being in the, uh, and I worked for a lot, for companies I always worked for was custom equipment and, and building things and designing automation. And so I've been able to kind of see the trajectory of the, what can be done um, with the technology. And um, even though it looks like it's doing something and it's really easy, there's a lot of stuff that goes in the background to make that happen and to keep it running constantly. So um, I guess from that perspective, you're you're banking a lot of a lot of the company on this equipment. You just got to make sure. What I've kind of learned is you got to make sure you got the people in place to make sure it stays running, uh, so that you can gain those benefits from it. So I, you know, from changing over from hardwiring to re or relays to com uh, computers and PLCs and CNCs and just. Uh, you know what the capabilities are now with these robots um, it's been astounding but it's still not easy all the time yeah. well John I'm gonna stick with you is kind of uh, I think with your experience and working with a lot of different companies I really believe when we sit out here in the audience and we so how is this applicable to me how am how can I in my shop or in my business 
embrace some of these things. I think we have a hard time seeing outside of our own box sometimes. So Joe, talk to me about some of the emerging trends and what are some of the real life examples you're seeing some of your clients do? So as was mentioned in uh, the one um, automation um, presentation, robotics is becoming, I mean, they've been around for a long time. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, but over the last couple years, they've really taken off and that's primarily with uh, collaborative robots. And you know, the reason for that is when you use a traditional robot that will have no issues hurting you if you get in the wrong place at the wrong time with it and you got cages around it, that's a big cost uh, for any system that you're putting together. The cobots, you still have to be careful. You still have to do risk assessments to make sure that they're implemented correctly. But there is uh, a better, how should I say, um, potentially better payoff for the collaborative robots because of certain things you don't have to deal with with regard to, to guarding. Um, an example would be um, contract manufacturers, uh, the companies that are doing machining, machine shops, uh, machine tending robots are becoming uh, more and more prevalent in the industry. So you don't have somebody just standing there watching the part to get done and then take it out and put a new part in, fixture it up. Uh, robots are starting to take the place of that. We've got a couple customers that we're working with right now. Uh, you know, they got 24 CNC machines and both of these companies have said, in five years, I'm not gonna have, I don't wanna have people just standing around watching the machine run. Um, they wanna have robots in there doing that. Now, that's a great vision and some of them may get to that point, but there's still a lot of work that goes into um, installing a robot, even a collaborative robot for a project. Um, it impacts not only that machine, but it impacts upstream and downstream operations. Um, and the process itself has to be pretty solid. Automation likes consistency. Um, I know there's a lot of things coming out now that make it more flexible, but for the small, smaller manufacturers, consistency is good, and high volume, uh, low mix is still kind of the thing you wanna work toward, at least to start out with. Coming down the pike when things, um, you know, the software takes over, then, you know, low volume, uh, high mix, then will become more prevalent. But right now, uh, I mean, there's companies, and to the point earlier in the discussion, those same companies that are saying, we're gonna have robots running these machines, they're not looking at getting rid of their operators. Those operators are actually pretty good machinists. Those robots haven't figured out how to actually set up the machine yet. Maybe someday they will, but they still need the human touch to make sure everything's working okay for the robot to take over. So they're not really looking at getting rid of people. They're looking at getting them to do more responsible things and probably get more money for it. Jeremy, what are you seeing in the emerging trends? And then, you know, obviously you guys are solving a lot of customers' um, issues. What are the, in addition to that, what are they, what else are they asking you to do for them? Well, um, I don't know I get deeply specific on this, but what I've jotted down just so I didn't forget it was, an emerging trend that's not specifically an automation trend, but a trend related to automation is um, where people were a few years ago talking to us about projects. Now they're all at our door and they're all pounding on the door. Um, it's some of them wish they could have acted sooner. Some are glad that they did act sooner. Um, and uh, some jobs in, the, in this industry that I'm learning about is art not just needing to be mitigated, but they will be eliminated because they just, it's not likely that uh, people will continue to chase a job like lumber grading. Um, so there's a lot of people who do lumber grading and flipping boards and it just doesn't appeal to younger generations uh, when they have more options. So um, that to me is the biggest trend about automation is just, it's really just more about the demand and it's like the necessity is the mother of invention phrase. It's just, you just can't get the people. We have people who have dozens and dozens, if not a hundred lumber graders across all these, you know what I mean? It's just, that's just one position. And I don't know, but there's plenty of other ones too, but it's one that I don't know that's gonna be around at least in a very minor uh, facet in the future. 
It's just something that needs to happen because there just aren't the bodies to fill those roles anymore. And you have got to have those people, somebody doing that process of lumber grading. It's not gonna be at, at the store if someone's not grading the lumber. And that's what determines pricing and all that stuff, so. Thank you. Mara, merging trends. Oh man, well, to kind of piggyback off of that, I think that people are looking for ways to reduce repetition, especially for their employees that are out on the floor. So one of the things that we, um, Tim, you should have brought a box, I could have showed it. Um, but one of the things that happens with, with our box is the sides have to get folded down and then a lid has to get applied. So that's a very, uh, a very repetitive motion that uses a ton of, you know, muscles in your back and your shoulders and and it's just something that no one wants to stand around and do anymore um so you know having things that kind of replace those repetitive motions um not only help out your employees because now they're super excited that they don't have to do the folding but they can go on and do something else um but it you know it, it saves it saves costs in other areas um, health costs, things like that. If you're having someone who's doing something so strenuous and you can automate that, um, I think a lot of companies are looking towards that just so that they can um, keep employees happy. You gotta keep them happy if you want them to stay. So, um, you know, keeping, keeping that in mind and keeping how you can, again, elevate your employees, but also reduce some of the things that, that they're doing manually on a daily basis really helps. It's a great point. Thank you. Randy? Um, I think cobots and AGVs, I think, are huge. Um, every, everybody's trying to get them. Everybody's trying to, <laughs> if they can get them, they're putting them in place. I just got a, a text last week from a small machine shop, like Joe was talking, less than 10 employees. He's, he's very, I would say, progressive as far as uh, being efficient and, and things. And he sent me a little video of a cobot that he had installed on one of his machining centers. And uh, his, he has one guy, one, one employee operates three machines now. With implementing this, one person will, should be able to handle five machines. Uh, that's what his hope is. And he's like this, and it was, he's, the video was it running our parts. We've done business with them for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just a small little shop, but they're investing, he's investing in that. Yeah. So I, th that's where I see it. It's a, gr it's a great point and something, you know, it didn't, you don't think about at first, but keep in mind as, as all of you grow, you put additional demand on your suppliers. And what you're seeing is a lot of these larger companies are forcing, be, due to their growth, they're asking you as their supplier, how are you gonna grow with us? How are you going to be able to meet our needs? And that's gonna be extremely important if you wanna do business with some of, these, some of these companies as well too. So great point. How would you, how would you comment on how your organization is approaching the advancement of technology as it relates to manufacturing? So I guess to, do you have a, uh, and Randy, I'm gonna start with you, do you have a technology group or committee that is getting together? Who's bringing up these ideas and, and kind of how are you, how is that flourishing and being talked about within your company? Well, we have, we have uh, process engineers for every department and so they're, they're working at those things. And, and we have a very, I would say, a very strong continuous improvement uh, process that's part of our culture. Um, <clears throat> and that, between that and, and they report to maintenance, head of maintenance and facilities. So they're, they're looking at it overall of how do we, boy, if there's a bottleneck here, what do we have to do? Um, so that, that's how we're kind of handling that. Uh, but there's other things that go into play there, like quality uh, and safety. Safety is a big one. Um, there's, there's areas where, like you were saying, boy, that hurts my back when I do that. Mm -hmm. Is there an area we can put a cobot in 
in the future to, to eliminate that. Just completely eliminate that, that risk. Uh, so I think that's, I don't know. Mara? Um, hold on, read the question one more time. How did the advancement of this technology and robotics come about? Is there, was it one person's idea? Was it a technology committee? So at Kitty Poo Club, um, it is very, uh, one of the most technological companies that I've been with. Everything from setting up our e-commerce site to our subscription platform to getting that back into um, our ERP system, everything is automated. So um, there's no order entry. There's, there's going to virtually be no purchasing. Um, it'll be done by a, a specific program that got implemented. So um, using our developers who are you know, kind of on the front end of our, of our website and figuring out how all that technology works, then has really driven the back end because the the thing for us is we had to automate so that we could produce more boxes. If we didn't automate, we would be stuck at around probably 2,000 orders a day that we could send out, or 2,000 boxes a day that we could make. Now with the technology and the automation that was put in, the opportunity there is to now produce 7,500 boxes. So um, we saw that there was a huge demand kind of pushed onto us because of the front end uh, technology and advertising and just the push to e-commerce and subscription that almost kind of forced our hand to make sure that we were having the the technology needed to get all of the orders out so we kind of worked backwards a little bit um, put the cart before the horse a little bit um, and had way too many orders and had to figure out okay how do we how do we get this to a point where now we can double triple quadruple and have a plan to do that moving forward Jeremy, how about you guys? Um, so yeah, I answered this question uh, a little while ago as I t thought about it. I, I wrote it down and for us, it's essentially listening to our the industry. Um, some of the things that we have designed, people have come to us and said, you know, oh, you guys do this, oh, you do that, you know, and we're like, I don't know that we're that inventive. We were just more determined to come up with a solution to the problems we've heard from clients who've had other similar equipment so we've just tried to make it better but uh, so you know commenting on the organization approaching the advancement of technology um, the partnership is is um, we couldn't do it without the partnership you know we're a company of about 65 employees we do not have a dedicated R&D department you know I think you would find money for an R&D department and could could probably have some in bankroll. If you knew that it, you got it to work, you'd sell millions. Well, we sell dozens. So our R&D department is the customer. You know, so they're capex, they're high risk. You know, people's jobs and livelihoods are on the line for this stuff when they make the right purchase to, to make sure that it works. So it's it's high stakes is the way we see it. But we rely on our customers, especially the more custom that particular project may be, um, to get it right. So we. I mean, I can't, uh, listening to our customer is pretty much the answer. Uh, we, we push our partners. We have some good partnerships with different machinery that integrates with ours. Um, we push them when it's un uncomfortable for them. Um, and we push ourselves. Ownership pushes our people. But it's all, it goes back to what I said before about the challenging, you know. Um, I like to say a little joke about puzzles. As like, you know, when you're a kid and you learn how to do a 12 or 16 piece puzzle, when you're a little bit older, you wouldn't do a 16 piece puzzle. You'd do a 30 or a 100 or 500. You know, you, people want to be challenged and you have to challenge them. And that's what we do all the time. And uh, there's, we never run out of thoughts and ideas and we can't do them all, but we listen to what is the most important. So really, I mean, half our ideas, maybe 90% of our ideas just comes from straight feedback from the customers. And then we just try to focus on, this is something that we gotta do or something that could be beneficial to them or us, but uh, that's essentially how we approach it. <laughs> Makes sense, thanks Jeremy. Joe, your situation's a little different with customers bringing you in. How are they normally getting to that point and what are you seeing when you go in and working with them? So a couple things that Magnet does. Magnet is part of this network in, in the US called the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. There's at least one Magnet 
com like company in every state in the U.S. and some territories. Uh, Ohio, because there's such a manufacturing um, environment here, we've got five. And our region is Northeast Ohio. Um, so one of the things that Magnet is tasked with doing is growing manufacturing in this area. And my understanding from Team Neo, they said there's like 7,700 manufacturing establishments in Northeast Ohio alone. Um, so our goal is to try to, as well as working with them to try to grow the business, try to educate people and make them, have them understand what the possibilities are. So uh, one of the things we've done is made an investment in our facility up in Cleveland is uh, like a technology experience. So we've got a number of collaborative robots. We've got some augmented reality um, uh, displays that show, I think, on the, uh, on the video that uh, the gentleman from Styles was showing, uh, where it's kind of showing people how they, you know, put stuff together. I think you had mentioned it as well. It's an augmented reality system where it shows the operator and guides them through every step of the process. So you can use that for training or just quality control. Um, we've got one of those little uh, AGV-type autonomous robots with a cobot on top of it running around the shop. So just trying to get people uh, with some hands-on experience as to what you know could happen maybe in their facility. Um, we've even had companies come in and borrow our stuff uh, to test things out uh, for themselves before they make the, the leap into it. Um, the other thing we've done is we've partnered with a number of manufacturers to create uh, what they call these lighthouses. So using higher technology, um, machines and systems, robots, inter Internet of Things, um, we're working with them to implement them in their facilities, and then they're going to allow uh, other manufacturers to come in and see what they've done. And again, it's more of an education thing. You'll get a bunch of manufacturers talking to other manufacturers uh, because, uh, you know, as, again, I'll keep referencing the gentleman consultants, you know, I didn't even like consultants before I started working for Magnet. No, I'm, <laughs> it's okay now. Um, but, you know, just seeing how somebody else has done it and talking to them about what their experience is, is tells a lot more better story than somebody telling them what they think could happen and hasn't really done it themselves. Um, next question. So we talk a lot about the labor savings and readjusting of labor and where people are going to go. What are some of the other benefits of automation? And Joe, I'll start with you. What that they're seeing that we might not be thinking about? Well, um, a couple of them have already been mentioned here as far as capa capacity is a big deal. Uh, you know, a company is growing. I mean, and the thing you have to take into account is um, if you're behind the eight ball already, there's no magic it's going to say, okay, I just bought this robot, and now I'm going to be up to speed. I mean, there's a lot that goes into these things. But, you know, capacity and planning for capacity increases and kind of taking that leap of faith in some instances. Um, safety, again, is a big deal. Um, uh, you're really replacing people who are doing jobs that really nobody wants to do in a lot of cases. And so, you know, if you're already starting from that point, trying to hire somebody to do it and having them stay with it is going to be a real challenge. So if you can identify the jobs that are just dirty and monotonous, um, you know, trying to figure out how you automate, and it could be a really simple thing, but, you know, making that happen um, certainly will help, um, you know, your, your business just keep running, I think, in a lot of cases. Um, and the ROI comes into it, but again, there's a lot of businesses out there that we've talked to. It's not necessarily an ROI issue. It's, I'm not, there's business I'm not getting because I can't fill the orders. Um, and so they'll factor that into the equation rather than a straight hey, it's going to take me six or 12 months to pay something back. They're looking at what they're losing by not doing it. Yeah, great point. Do you, either, any of you three want to add anything to that? I don't want you to have to say the same thing, but is there anything else you guys can think of that, in addition to what Joe says? Just a requ It's a requirement for growth for yeah. us. Yeah. I think from a quality standpoint, too, um, you know, humans make errors, so... Robots may make errors sometimes, too. Hey, speak for yourself. But I'm just saying. Um, but, you know, from a, from a quality standpoint, 
you can move from you know that this repetitive motion is done the same way the same time as long as it's being checked then you can have more assurance that it's being done correctly um, safety is a huge issue so that's you know everything f from injuries to workman's comp to <coughs> if you can automate that really you know like the the press that's that's a really really big issue that you have to worry about with safety so um, you can help eliminate those expenses from your business too. You can lower your workman's comp rate maybe. You can lower um, you know, any claims or things like that. So from a quality and safety perspective, it's, it's, a, really, it's a really good thing to have. That's a great point. I think a lot of companies don't really factor those X factors into the equation. They just go, I'm gonna make X number of parts and I'm gonna have this much margin so I can pay it back in six months. They're not putting in the other peripheral things that can really, really make a difference in getting a project going. Yeah, I'd like to just, uh, on that, I'll just explain a quick story uh, on a conference call we had probably six months ago with a, a really good partner of ours where it, the owner was speaking and we were doing the screen share and looking at it and uh, there's a, a saw that we make that's got uh, hoggers on the edge that t takes the trimmings off so you don't have these, these these waste pieces and in a lot of facilities there's a guy or a gal who that's all they do and hopefully they rotate so it's not just that person all the time you won't retain them but that's all they do is grab it and throw it grab it and throw it all day long that's all they do and if you're not careful they know right where they're throwing it they'll throw it right at you if you were walking because they know right <laughs> where it is i've had some go whizzing by my head and anyway i just remember hearing this uh this owner on the phone he just says no we're going to do the hoggers and um, just listening, we kind of anticipated that. It wasn't a surprise. He goes, otherwise, he's like, I got to get someone to write an ad. We got to listen to people for the ad. We got to interview these people. We got to select one or a couple. Then we got to train them. Then we got to drug test them. Then we got to bring them in and, and, and you know, get them acclimated, get them a locker, get them their packet, get them their handbook, safety videos. And two days later, they quit and never come back. He goes, I'm tired of it. <laughs> he's like, he's like I'm, I'm just done with that. And that, that guy, just, there is no position for that anymore as long as you can keep that machine running. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's a great point. A transition into, Randy, tell us a little bit about either a horror story or what not to do. I... I could tell you horror stories about ERP implementations, <laughs> but we won't go there. But um, I, I don't really have any horror stories on, on implementing uh, automation stuff. The, the, like I said before, the, the biggest regret is waiting too long. That's just should have done it sooner. Yeah. Mara, any? We'll share our ERP stories later. Pretty much everything Cheryl said, we did diff like. We didn't do. So take what Cheryl said and do it. Um, for us, the biggest thing is, was, is finding a really good partner. So someone who's going to make your machinery, supply you with the spare parts that you need, tell you the spare parts that you need, help you order the spare parts that you need, um, and not leave you hanging. So um, we had three different machines made. Um, as soon as they got to the <laughs> to the warehouse didn't necessarily work the way that we needed them to um, but at that point we had made the decision to move forward spent the money um, but trying to get a hold of them was a really hard uh, a really hard task they weren't available so finding um, finding someone who understands what you're doing why you want to do it and how it's going to help you and really making sure that you have that support behind you um, you know, if you're down, you're not shipping. And we were, were shipping, you know, 2,000 orders a day to customers every single day. Um, so on a Monday, if you come in and your machine's not working, that's 6,000 orders that you can't get out. So um, I would say for, uh, for us, the biggest thing was finding, um, finding partners to work with that had a really good technical support uh, behind them. So, so we didn't have all the horror stories that we maybe had. Jeremy, anything to add? Um, I don't. 
I think it could apply to anything. I mean, everything we do is some sort of an automation project, but I just jotted down a couple things that popped in my head, which would be the sort of the uh, understanding of expectations versus interpretations. So when we write a proposal and we discuss and we collaborate, um, the, the, if I review a proposal, the, most, the first thing I go to is the project parameters. So we have to make sure that there's not a missed expectation there. Those are the horror stories we've had where maybe we missed an expectation there and they interpreted it a different way than we did and uh, it made for more of a painful installation or whatever. So I mean, we, we do our best to eliminate that. Obviously that's not just an automation thing, but when people get automation, especially when they're not used to automation, you know, the risk is a little bit higher because you have to make sure that they really understand what they're about to get into. And there's also the, this is not a horror story. I, I found it funny, but we had a customer who got, who ramped up their speed very fast, fast saw, fast scanner, all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm looking around at the start and the finish and I'm going around. I'm like, this is great. Smiling. They're happy. They're happy. And then I got to the end of the line and I just saw a couple sorters just looking like they were under attack and sweating <laughs> and like they were just constantly and the boards were piling up and I was like, you know, uh, I about them. okay. So we, uh, yeah. And, uh, they, they, they fixed that very quickly. I, I mean, we talk about this is what's going to come through. This is your throughput. We can't completely manage their business. And they said, we got that, you know, and we've been back. Didn't take any time for, they just put a little bit more manpower, whatever. So even though we minimized the manpower here, it kind of went downstream. However, the overall ROI was improved. Yeah, but uh, it was much smoother the next time I visited, but I saw them and I was like, oof, you gotta do something about that. <laughs> so, you, you wasn't really a horror you story, but. Friends, but yeah, you made some yeah we, we, we didn't go to the end of the line. We, <laughs> we exited. I, I think that is really important. Like management can make these decisions but really going to the people who are working on the line every day they're going to tell you what works and what doesn't work and so having them involved even if it's you know one meeting or two meetings and just walking through the whole process with them they're going to tell you well what about this well what about this well this is going to you know send us into a frenzy once it gets down the line so having not only just your upper management communicating and talking about we're going to put all this automation into place, but having your people who are going to be doing that job is really important too, because they're going to be the ones who have to catch all the logs at the at the end of the the shoot. So, yeah. Joe, you know your situation is is definitely a little different, but do you feel that you're brought in soon enough? A lot of times when these companies make the connection and say, "Hey, we want you to come in. This is what we want." Are you involved early enough? Yeah, um, a lot of, so the way we approach these projects is um, we do it in a phase typically. So the first phase, to your point, on specifications. Um, I mean, a lot of companies don't have the bandwidth to write down and figure out what that process requirements are uh, and put the specification together. And that's so that you can align everybody's expectations, as you mentioned, um, from the get-go. Um, so if we can get in at that point, then things go a lot smoother after that. And let, if you don't have that baseline understanding of exactly, and I mean pretty much exactly what you want to try to do because you're talking money with every feature you put into a system that you don't need. And um, in some instances you get into the situation where they want to build the dream machine. I got 50 different parts I want to run. I want it to run everything. even though. Maybe 80% of those parts I only make three times a year. Uh, so, you know, trying to understand, you know, we ask for uh, forecasts and, uh, and production numbers from companies. And a lot of times they don't, they, it's like, well, why do you want that? Well, we're trying to figure out really what you want to use this machine for so that you can um, customize it for that. And maybe those other ones, you either keep doing the way you're doing because you don't do them that much. Um, so getting that upfront uh, understanding uh, is very important. Um, sometimes you get the customer who comes in and says, well, I already know what I want. We just want you to do it. Um, but then you got to, we try to walk them back a little bit to make sure we understand more about what they're trying to do and maybe make some suggestions otherwise if that's necessary. Um, but more times than not, we were able to get in there at the start. I mean, I've, 
not with Magna, but for other companies I work for, probably the, one of the best stories I have is we, it's for a large aerospace manufacturer and uh, very intricate parts. They asked us to come, we'd done business with them before, they asked us to put together this um, uh, proposal for a machine, um, autom automated equipment. And so we did, we got the okay, we started going off designing it, they gave us a purchase order, so we met with their team, and they're like, what are you guys, what are you guys talking about? So what do you mean? What are you talking about? It's right in here in the proposal. It's kind of, kind of like what, you, what you're talking, you know, mentioning is that well, the upper management didn't necessarily tell the technical team what it is that they had asked us to purchasing didn't tell us didn't tell them exactly what they put in their their specs. So we had to stop everything, start over again, talk to the technical team, and get all that ironed out. But you know, that's that's an, an that's an interesting meeting to have with a customer. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody in the audience have any specific questions for anyone? Sure. I have a question. Is there an industry standard ROI return time? I mean, is there kind of something that's expected? Not that I'm aware of. There's, there's probably 10 different ways that you can calculate it. Um, you know, a lot of companies um, just do what's my return on investment over a period of time. Um, but there's time value of money. I mean, you can get really complicated into how you, uh, the factors you put into it. But I'd say probably 90% of the companies that we work with is how long does it take me to pay that equipment off based on what it's going to output for me over a period of time. That is the common one that I've been involved in, just straight ROI. Uh, but as these guys and Mara have said, there's so much more today that goes into it than just the, the calculations we can do. Yeah, you have to look at the opportunity. I think he had said that in his presentation. If you look at the opportunity of what the orders you could be bringing in, if you factor that in, then your ROI is going to decrease significantly because you're going to be able to maybe double your business in a year, whereas if you calculated the ROI, maybe you didn't get that until year three or something like that. So I think now it's really important to, to figure out what that opportunity is, especially when you're starting with automation because you have to make that decision kind of, not really in blind faith, but you got to have a little faith put behind it because you're going to go and spend all of this money hoping that it, that it works out. So factoring that opportunity really helps you project for the future and know that you know, the, the equipment that you're going to be putting in is going to double or is going to triple your business in, in a certain amount of time and look at it that way and then kind of back in to maybe what a traditional ROI would look like. Does that help? Anybody else? I think a, I think a little bit of that is, I think back to our first laser we bought, Whew. the sweat that went into that one, trying to make that decision. Now, uh, we ordered one this year, we're gonna order another one next year. It's, it's like a muscle. Once, you, once you've, you've practiced, oh, yeah, that makes good business sense. I mean, if you're good business people, you know, that makes sense. Let's just do it. And, and once you see that that's successful, the next one's easier. And it's like, okay, that faith <laughs> is like, yeah. The faith's eased let's a little do bit. It. You know, I, I sat back there in the back and approved a whole bunch of CapEx. <laughs> I have to admit, it wasn't Facebook. <laughs> Andrew. Andrew. But it was CapEx. <laughs> But I think getting started and doing it, I don't know, the next one is easier. Yeah. So uh, closing thoughts, Randy. Anything that we didn't ask you feel we should tell people? Hmm. I, I think one of our successes has been we've always had people, and, and I've seen in other businesses, <clears throat> where their job, either it's either their job or a committee's job, to look at processes and improve them. And companies that just don't have time for that, they're gonna get passed by. Um, make sure your business has the time and somebody's taking that and making it a priority to improve processes. And that'll get you there. I don't know, that's... That's a great point. Marini. Yeah, I, I echo that. You know, 
if you have a bad process, you're going to have bad automation. So having a good process first is really the, the biggest thing. So looking into that and, and making sure that how you're running is, you know, is the most efficient and then how you can increase that efficiency. But I would go back to, you know, it, when you are looking for those improvements, don't just look at, you know, your managers and above, look at your employees and ask them the questions of, hey, how do, how do I make your job maybe not easier, but how do I make your job more efficient? Because they're gonna have they're gonna have the ideas. And that open level of communication with everyone then makes everyone feel like they're in it together and you get a ton more buy in um, that way. So if if I would have to say anything, it's it's having open communication with everyone in the organization, knowing what you're doing, knowing what the steps are, and knowing what they're going to get out of it. Because as soon as you say automation, employees are going to think, oh my gosh, I'm not going to have a job in six months. But if you explain that, no, this is going to elevate the company, now you're going to have maybe these responsibilities, then they're going to want to they're going to want to do that. They're going to want to excel with you and elevate their themselves as well. So I would say communication with your employees is probably the top of my list. Thank you. Jeremy? Well, um, I don't know that I have a lot to say here other than just, you know, the, if it's automation related, or my standpoint, my viewpoint, um, the, the people that are out there like, say, us, that could help uh, another manufacturer. Um, everything we do on the front end before we get a job is essentially free. <laughs> so it's like, you know, you just have to, and the other thing is you look at the internet, right? Um, YouTube's got a lot of bad, it's got a lot of good, but you just gotta focus on the good. Um, the things I've learned that are just so easy to find at fingertip by just searching online. I've, I've found software ideas, all kind of implemented some, some I'm actually engaging. It's just, I mean, it, it took no time at all just to find some potential answers. And then that leads to potential people who, who can actually have been there. So um, not to mention people usually lo love to feel um, valuable. So like if you know someone at an industry that you think, you know, I wonder if they give me some time. You buy them lunch, I, they probably will give you time. They, they want to help people. Most people want to help people. Um, one thing I wrote down I didn't mention before, but was with automation or making that purchase or analyzing the return on investment, I think most people understand that if you're paralyzed by, what is it, the paralysis analysis paralysis. thing, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you can't hit a home run if you don't swing the bat, but, you, but they're afraid that they're gonna strike out if they swing the bat. I think the risk versus reward the best poker players in the world aren't just really, really lucky. They know more than you do. So like you, you, if you haven't done your research and you haven't talked to these companies like us who are good at what we do, don't invest, you're not ready yet. So, but once you've done your research and you feel good and you'll never win anything if you don't take a little bit of risk and put, put some money on the table. So the risk reward, building relationships, uh, doing your research, it just requires work and time and effort. And if you keep saying you don't have enough time, that's an excuse to let you off the hook. I think you have to somehow create the time. Um, if you say, I never have seven hours to work on this project, I don't have seven hours to do this, that's what it's gonna take. If your water heater broke and you need seven hour, hours to clean it up, you'd find the time, right? So you gotta find the time to do those things that matter most. So. Joe? I guess I would echo, um, especially what you said about uh, communication, um, don't, live in a box in your you know like this this automation only affects your department because probably it's going to affect everything upstream and downstream how parts are <coughs> delivered to it how many you know if you need to get your purchasing group involved because now you've got a new piece of equipment and now you've got to be able to get you know spare parts and get that rolling what's going to happen to your shipping department so there's a lot of dominoes that fall once you make that make that commitment um, and communicating it is uh, is vital and especially to your point on the shop floor because an operator is going to make or break whatever you put on that shop floor if they don't like it and um, I guess you got options of not having that <laughs> operator anymore and get somebody who does but it can be pretty painful and so you know communication and uh, the culture even though we're talking about machines it really comes back to the human element. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank all four of you for being here, your time and, and sharing with us your stories. We appreciate that. 
Uh, thank you to all our speakers today. Uh, thank for, thankful for all of you for coming. Uh, hopefully you found something worthwhile. Um, a lot of these speakers today, as our manufacturing group, we sat around about a year and a half ago and said, what are our clients needing? And what are the issues we're seeing in the industry? And um, automation was one of them. And uh, we said, we've got to go out and find some companies and find some people who are able to help clients because we believe this is one of the next things in a lot of our clients' journeys. So yes, we're in Holmes County and, and Tuscarawas County and Wayne County, but there are people around to help. We do have a lot of connections now due to going out and finding them. Magnet is a great solution. Uh, they're a great partner, they're great people. Uh, so there are options. So if you've got questions, you want to talk to somebody, talk to your Ray representative, we can get you hooked up with somebody, but uh, don't feel like you're alone. Don't feel like uh, you got to go at it by yourself uh, because there are people around to help. We have, uh, we have very high expectations of our people and, and our company, uh, and that's to solve problems and challenges that each of you have. So. Thank you for being here, we appreciate it. If you want any more trinkets on the way out the door, uh, there's donuts, take some of this food, uh, but uh, have a great afternoon, have a great weekend, and it was great seeing all of you, thank you.